Middle College, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, I was a junior resident uh, when she was working as senior resident at Mulan Azad Middle College, and uh, she had uh, uh, she had done a research fellowship in rhinology from University of Chicago. Uh, she did a primary training uh, uh, in head and neck surgery from Loyola University Medical Center. And she also has uh, done a fellowship from Rhinology uh, Department of Stanford University. So uh, I invite uh, Dr. Devani Lal to deliver the keynote address on frontal sinus. How do I approach? Dr. Devani Lal. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. Um, uh, Dr. Mayor, um, it was absolutely a privilege to be invited to present amongst this August membership to the meeting of the ICOM uh, 2021. And um, I uh, have had a long journey and we're separated by a couple of oceans and about 12 hours of time. But my heart, uh, my family and everyone near and dear closest to me uh, still is in India. So um, it is a very humble and privileged moment for me uh, to be giving back uh, to uh, my land of birth. Um, can I go ahead and start my presentation? Yes, yes, you can share your screen. Okay, I'll try to make sure that I can assign myself to the correct screen. Can you guys see? Yes, we can see that. Okay, very good. So um, as Dr. Meher introduced, um, I am Deviani Lal. I am currently at Mayo Clinic in uh, one of our southern sites, which is in Arizona. And uh, Dr. Meher and the organizers, I thank you uh, for letting me talk about a subject that I'm fairly passionate about, and that is about frontal sinus surgery. And what I'm going to present is a very personal approach uh, that I have uh, developed over uh, 15, the last 15 years or so. And a lot of it is attributed to my experience with my own patients whom I've learned from, as well as everyone uh, that has been involved in my training. And that does include several people who are on the panel today, including I see Dr. Mathur, Dr. Ishwar Singh, uh, and uh, several other people uh, who I'll hopefully uh, get time to mention uh, later on. I practice at Mayo Clinic in Arizona, uh, which is about a 316 bed hospital which is very, very small when you compare it to the sizes of hospitals like uh, MAMC or Ames or RML. Uh, but it's actually a very efficiently run organization. And in the United States, a lot of surgeries are performed outpatient. So our hospital has consistently maintained um, a top 20 position for the last five years. The hospital itself is about 35 years or old or so. And uh, we consistently are very high ranking in all subspecialty practices. And uh, this year, 2021, 2022, um, our uh, small 300 bedded hospital, uh, the Department of ENT was ranked as number six and will beat out several other organizations, including Stanford and uh, very, very uh, large name organizations. And we were two behind Mayo Clinic in Rochester, which is really a proud accomplishment for a department, uh, which at the time of the rating had only eight staff members. Um, and then I'm proud also to be part of an integrated practice uh, where I can leverage the strengths of people in allergy, immunology, neurosurgery, radiology, et cetera. And those definitely help us in, in, in the, the best uh, uh, possible care of our patients. So, um, I put this slide because I couldn't really find <laughs> slides from India uh, in the reorganization of my home, but I have here Dr. Gulati and Dr. Agrawal, Dr. Gulati uh, were my unit heads when I was in MAMC, and these are some of the colleagues. Uh, this is actually Klaus Bakert. He was at one of our conferences. This is Larry Borish, and this is one of my colleagues in allergy immunology. His name is Matthew Rank, and I have published several papers with him on uh, pathophysiology and medical management. Um, in summary, I'm just gonna share three um, different aspects of what I have found helpful. Um, and my approach is to basically tackle the frontal sinus uh, by identifying my friends, anatomical structures that I can identify on CT, correlate with endoscopy to just 
have a guide map, a road map, a Google map uh, to um, have a GPS to my dissection. And then I try to uh, train uh, my learners, and my residents, students, et cetera, that uh, are also in courses to apply a systematic approach and not get lost in the trauma of just performing surgery in a dangerous territory. And certainly there is benefit if you intend uh, to have a practice dedicated to frontal sinus surgery to invest uh, in the proper uh, instrumentation. And some of them are quite affordable. Some of them can be cost prohibitive. Uh, uh, Dr. Mayer mentioned about uh, being involved in publishing this book. Uh, this book was co-written with Peter Wong, who was my fellowship director at Stanford. And every year we do a um, talk at the Academy and several of the images, et cetera, are uh, from uh, the book. And I acknowledge the publishers for their permission as well as Mayo Clinic. So a little bit about instrumentation. Um, and, and these are some of uh, what I have found helpful. So I use reverse angle scopes and uh, a majority of my dissection is actually performed uh, with a 30 degree endoscope. Uh, certainly the Australians have written about just working with a zero degree endoscope. And I like to use uh, a reverse angle scope. So reverse angle scope uh, is one where the post actually comes on the same side as the angle. And that means that when I'm instrumenting into the nose, as I'm here in this picture, I can instrument under the scope and the post is not in the way. Um, I also like to use sleeves. These are irrigating sleeves. These are disposable sheets, but certainly you can also find steel and non-disposable sheets. And especially if you're performing surgery in a bloody field with revision polyp surgery, et cetera, it speeds up the surgery. And I think it's just an emotional <laughs> uh, companion for you as, as you negotiate some challenging fields. If you have the ability or, uh, or the center you work ha um, has the ability to get a navigation or a computerized image navigation system, it's extremely helpful uh, for revision sinus surgery as well as frontal sinus surgery. And I also find not only the navigation aspect of it helpful as I um, have learned to understand the anatomy, but also in, uh, in uh, transmitting that training to my uh, trainees. And I find these 3D link views extremely uh, helpful uh, in teaching. Um, and then there's a variety of instruments. Um, and these are basically, I think, my go-to instruments. Uh, I have a few more instruments, but uh, what I leverage are basically these Qun instruments, which are angle instruments. I use uh, the 45 degree instrumentation as well as the 90 for higher dissection when I'm working with 70 degree scopes. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I'll use the 90 degree instrumentation. Uh, these are micro debriders. There are several companies that make uh, these. I uh, use two of these, um, a 40 degree and a 60 degree. And there's also a smaller, more angled uh, 2.9 millimeter um, uh, micro debrider that I will use very occasionally uh, for some high frontal dissection. Um, if you have the availability of this malleable, uh, this is a suction which is actually quite malleable. And this can be bent uh, into various angles as you approach uh, the frontal uh, sinus. And then of course, um, some people call this the angle uh, kerosene. I have one which is big, one that is small. Uh, some people refer to this as the cobra. And here are two angled mushroom punches. These are my go-to. This is spring-loaded so it can cut through thick bone uh, and it can cut in any direction. So that's great. And the uh, kerosens are good at cutting anteriorly towards the auger complex on the frontal peak areas. And obviously curettes um, and frontal sinus seekers are helpful. And certainly when you have narrow spaces where you have to dissect uh, between um, the skull base and a cap uh, of a supravolar cell or posterior dissection, these um, angled uh, uh, probes can be very helpful uh, in uh, dissecting through that. I, I have to give acknowledgement to a lot of people um, uh, that have um, helped me in my journey towards rhinology. This is Valerie Lund and uh, this is um, David Howard, they are now married, but these were uh, my faculty when I did my fellowship and training in England and, and over a period of time. Um, and they have repaid uh, everything that they taught me by coming over and cooking and sweating over the kitchen stove and uh, producing jello shots for parties. Uh, so if you don't know what jello shots are, it's a good thing you shouldn't find out. Um, 
here I am again with this group of people. Uh, we, we love to um, learn from each other, love to uh, leverage each other's strengths. And I think more so than anywhere else, the frontal sinus can oftentimes um, be an area that can, um, the drainage pathway lies between dangerous structures. And this is a picture of the Grand Canyon, which is located in Arizona. And sometimes it feels like you're uh, on the edge of a precipice when you're operating in a dangerous territory, but by leveraging critical anatomy, I think you can have a nice backyard exposure with nice bunnies and a relaxing time um, doing surgery. And it can actually be quite pleasurable as you accomplish things um, that you didn't think that you could do before. Um, I'm not sure if we have residents or learners um, here, but uh, a little bit about the basic anatomy of the frontal sinus drainage pathway. And, a little bit about what I will use as terminology. So the frontal sinus drainage pathway includes um, the part where the sinus narrows, and this is in the post-remedial part of the sinus. Uh, it narrows into a narrow area, which we um, have um, termed the frontal ostium, but there's no true frontal ostium. There's just a simple passage that goes down um, uh, towards the nose. And the part above the frontal ostium area is known as the frontal infundibulum. And the part that is in the nose below the ostium area is called the frontal recess. And so the important part is that the old concept of calling this drainage pathway a frontal nasal duct is wrong because there is no duct. And it's essentially the surrounding structures, which are the ethmoidal structures, which will determine the shape, the size, and how the frontal sinus uh, will drain into the nose. Um, these are pictures uh, with 3D uh, views. And so this is actually the left frontal sinus. And here, this is a view through a frontal trepanation through the forehead through an eyebrow incision. And so this part as the frontal sinus, this is narrowing down and going down medially and posteriorly um, through the frontal infundibulum to what we call the osteum. And then uh, if we look through the nose, on the other hand, after dissection, uh, we see the frontal recess, which has now been opened up. This is the ostium area. And it, again, it will widen up into the frontal sinus area. Um, so the important thing um, uh, in when we instrument into the frontal recess from below is to understand that the frontal sinus is actually quite anterior from the ostium, since the ostium is posterior and medial. And so to instrument it, when we are probing it, the direction of the probe should always be anterior. So it should always hook up this way. And if we go straight up, we're in danger of hurting the skull base. Um, there are many terminologies uh, for frontal recess cells, but essentially there's an anterior complex of cells and there's a posterior complex of cells. And I'll refer to them as the auger complex, uh, which is based off this bone called the auger mound. And then the bulla complex, which is basically based off in relationship to the bulla. And the new IFAC classification that comes in from PJ Warmall's group is helpful. Uh, and it's helpful to understand and to convey to others, especially trainees, what it means. So if there's just pneumatization of this bone in the front part, uh, of the auger bone and one cell, it's called an agonese. If you have a bunch of cells over there, it's called a supra auger cell complex. And if these supra auger cells extend above the frontal ostium area into the frontal sinus itself, we call them supra auger frontal cells. And the same nomenclature follows in the Buller complex. You have the ethmoidal bulla, you may have supra buller cells. And if these supra buller cells extend into the true frontal sinus above the ostium area, they are called suprabullar frontal cells. Now we talked about how you can dissect out this entire frontal sinus drainage pathway by just dissecting these cells out. And if you just stayed below this frontal ostium uh, area, so for example, if you just had uh, ethmoidal bulla or supraagar cells that didn't extend into the frontal sinus, you could dissect all of this drainage pathway by just dissecting in the frontal recess below the ostium. And that operation is called a draft one operation. If you widen this area of the ostium, that is called a draft two A operation. And if, uh, uh, if you went all the way inside um, and dissected up all the way up, I'm sorry, that is a draft two A operation. If you stayed below it, it's a draft one operation. And then if you go into the sinus, 
um, after instrumenting the osseum and dissecting higher. That's the conventional term used to describe a draft away operation. And most of the surgeries that we do, even the revision surgeries that we do, are mostly draft away operations. And it's important to understand the relationship of the cells on um, CT scans. And I find uh, the uh, sagittal views most helpful to count these cells in relationship to the frontal sinus drainage pathway. And to all the trainees, I would recommend that you actually start looking at these sagittal views to identify the bulla, which lies just in front of this um, a hockey stick of the uh, middle turbinate. So you have the bulla right in front of it. And then the agar complex is just behind the nasal beak area and start identifying the drainage pathway. Uh, because by knowing how many cells we have to dissect, we'll be able to find out what we need to dissect. And these cells can also give us an idea when we look at just coronal sections on whether the cells are uh, in the from, coming from the anterior part of the bone or they are coming from the posterior aspect of the bone. And that's important to take down this agar cell. We'll have to go behind um, this agar cell, supra agar cell, and push it forward. Whereas if we have a supra buller cell, we actually need to kind of uh, push it slightly back before we can dissect this out. So that is very important. Um, the, uh, the agar complex cells are all dissected in an anterior dissection, and whether you have an agar or supra agar cell, the dissection is higher, but it's in the same manner using longer instruments, perhaps more angle instrumentation. So in the agar complex, we always go behind the agar cell and pull it forward and down. Whereas if we have a buller complex cell, because this is um, uh, 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 coming from the posterior table, the next slide will show uh, that we actually need to come in uh, from in front and then push it backwards so that we can make room to dissect it out. So um, the other thing that um, I was always worried about as a, as a trainee is about injuring the anterior ethmoidolotry. And in several older textbooks, um, it is mentioned that the anterior ethmoidolotry is just posterior to the frontal osteum, which would be about this area. But in reality, um, the uh, the anterior ethmoidal artery is in the area of the bulla, and it's always a space behind the frontal osteum area. So this is actually showing you a sagittal cut. This is showing you the correlate on a coronal cut. And this is the axial image, which shows that, uh, it, yes, the anterior ethmoidal artery will be in play as you dissect that posterior uh, frontal um, recess area, but it's not going to be right where the um, uh, frontal osteum is. Um, the link views, again, are exceedingly helpful in understanding that. And uh, again, for trainees, um, I, I tell them, start recognizing what the uh, unsinner process looks like, not just on the coronal views where we all identify it, but actually start looking at the sagittal complex, because this will show you how intimately uh, attached this unsinner process is, is to the agar cell and the agar complex area. And then the other thing that I point out to them is when you start looking for the frontal recess area, uh, you have to be very anterior and the axial uh, image will ground you. So here is actually the lacrimal bone with the nasolacrimal duct. We all know as when we do a maxillary entrostomy that we cut down all the way to the nasolacrimal duct. And so the unsinate is very anterior. And as you're looking for it, where you want to probe, make sure that you're not too far away from that um, uh, nasolacrimal duct area, probably a space or so behind that area. The cap of the agonese, again, T.J. Wormall has written about how this is very important and actually it has revolutionized the way that frontal sinus surgery is now done. And certainly I've adopted that into my practice and it's important to recognize. Again, it's an anterior cell. So you will see it right behind the area of the nasolacrimal duct. And then again, the anterior face of the bulla, find the hockey stick of the middle turbinate, the cell in front of it is the bulla, if there are multiple cells or uh, superbullar spaces, identify those as well. And finally, the frontal osteum area, again, it's good practice to start identifying where it is and, and kind of looking at what the angle of the frontal sinus drainage pathway will be. So the other um, uh, um, tip I have for you is actually, um, if you are uh, looking for where to probe as a beginner, 
start looking at where the maxillary um, uh, natural osteum is. As I said, that's going to be just behind your nasolacrimal duct area. And if you take an angle scope, like a 30, 45, or 70, it will actually send you in the general area and vicinity of where the probing will be. And the maxillary osteum and the frontal osteum are actually in similar uh, coronal planes. So stay anterior, because I've seen chief residents try to look all the way behind in the posterior complex as we do that. So this is the man who grounds me. So we'll talk about medial or lateral drainage and what it means uh, in, in looking for the um, uh, other frontal sinus. So essentially, this is to do with where the uncinate attaches. Now, the uncinate process itself can have multiple septations and various attachments. The attachments that are relevant are in the area of the drainage pathway of the frontal sinus. So it doesn't matter what the uncinate does behind, but you want to know what it is doing in the area of the agonese and the bulla. So we, we all know these diagrams. The most common drainage pathway of the uh, frontal sinus is actually into the middle meatus directly because the uncinate usually goes to either the bulla or to the lamina papyracea. So about two thirds, the drainage pathway will be in the medial direction. And in one thirds of the patient, it will be lateral to uh, the uncinate process. And this space, which is lateral to the uncinate process between the uncinate and the orbit is known as the infundibulum, the F model infundibulum. Um, one other caveat is be careful about mistaking high cells for the frontal sinus. And one way to know that you may have hit a high cell A, anticipate that by looking at the anatomy uh, beforehand. But also if your probe just hits a cap and stops, the frontal probe, then you're probably not in the true frontal <laughs> The other um, clue that I have is um, that when you look up into the frontal sinus and you see the sagittal ridge, this is only seen in the roof of the true frontal sinus, and you won't see that in, in the cap of a high agar cell or a buller cell. And lastly, look at where the transmit illumination is. If, if your transillumination is brightest in the medial cantal area, you're probably in an um, ethmoidal cell rather than the true frontal sinus, which will transilluminate brilliantly as you go in there. So with that, I'm gonna to transition to a couple of cases. And this is a simple dissection of the right frontal recess. So here we'll uh, talk about a rather simple anatomy. Here, uh, we're looking at the coronal cut we're looking at the agar, and then we identify the uncinate, which appears to be going towards the f model bulla. There appears to be um, one cell, a bulla, buller cell here and a suprabuller cell here. Um, and because the attachment is, uh, is lateral, um, go, uh, uh, lateral towards the f model bulla, we know that the drainage pathway is going to be medial. This is again the uh, sagittal view, the agonese cell, f model bulla, and a supravolar cell. So we have two cells behind B1, B2, and one cell um, in front. And we think that the frontal sinus drainage pathway is going to be directly into the middle meatus. So um, what I do uh, first is actually I finish up the entire dissection. Many people do it the other way around. Um, this is uh, performing a relaxing incision which I uh, developed through the uh, basal lamella where it joins the horizontal and the vertical parts. And that actually frees up a lot of space within. I like to use this um, pledged soap with one in 1000 epinephrine and we um, stain it with fluorescein so it's not accidentally injected. Once the dissection is completed, I always leave the superior third of the uncinate. And if it's a high bulla, I'll leave the cap of the bulla there too. And then this is the right side. This is the middle turbinate. And then this is the um, uncinate. I know it will be intimately in relationship to the um, agonese cell. Uh, this is the buller complex. And so the first thing I'll do is, um, you know, probe in that area to see whether it passes in freely because it's fairly easy anatomy. And this probe is passing freely at this juncture, going all the way in and never force it in. Otherwise you can go through that thin skull base. This is that angled kerosene. So I first opened that infundibular space with the um, uh, uncinate process. And then as I keep moving and removing it, I'll open up the um, agonese cell. 
And once you've identified the agonese cell um, and taken the cap off, two things happen. You have a straight shot at the frontal recess, which is gonna be just in front of the bulla. And, and it's just easier to see things. You can also use less angle scopes. Um, and then remove that cap. And then here it is, the opening to the frontal recess. And once I do that, and I've already identified the, um, uh, the skull base in the uh, mid ethmoidal complex, I will just go ahead and remove the bullar complex as I finish the dissection. So this is just going through the agar dissection. This is actually one of my residents doing it. And so we are finishing up, we go slow, we keep meticulous dissection. Once the anterior part is dissected off, here we've got the bullar complex. I like to use sharp instrumentation around the skull base. So this is just using a Blakesley because we've got good um, 30 degree uh, visualization. So I can use these straight instruments. And then I finish up using um, micro debriders for a very smooth transition from that posterior frontal table all the way into the skull base. And this is that mushroom punch, which is very helpful as you wanna take off things anteriorly or in a circumferential fashion. And last thing, don't forget to irrigate and remove all the bone chips from that area. This is an example of a more complex dissection. So here we have more cells than the last one. So we have, um, as we look into the sagittal and the um, uh, views and the coronal views, there are three cells of spaces anteriorly and three cells of spaces posteriorly. So um, the uncinate attaches to the bulla again. So the frontal drainage is medial. And so the concept of dissection is much the same. So this is the left side again. I finished my sphenoethmoidectomy. I removed the uh, um, area of the uncinate, open up the axilla. If it's highly pneumatized, I don't bother with putting up an axillary flap, et cetera. You can certainly do that, especially if the agar area is not very well pneumatized. But with pneumatized cells, you can just get a straight shot view with that. So remove the agonese, remove it, uh, and leave the cap. Once you do that, you're going to put your probe behind that organizy cell. This is a bloody um, uh, case. As you can see, uh, not all frontal sinus surgeries are easy, and this one certainly has uh, polyps, etc. And so you have to stop, kind of get hemostasis, and continue to remove that cell. Once you've removed the uh, first cell, which is the, uh, the organizy cell, we now have to find the supraagar cells. And again, dry it, be patient. Once we do that, again, the same um, instrumentation uh, technique using more angle scopes uh, becomes helpful. So again, get the cap of that first supraagar cell. Remove it. And then again, you'll probably have to end up using more angle scopes, et cetera as uh, we remove uh, the higher parts of this cell. And now I've switched to a 70 degree scope because now I've opened up that su second supraagar cell. And again, the probe doesn't pass. Same concept, um, not rocket science. It's just about understanding anatomy and understanding what instruments you need. So again, same process going in there, leveraging a more angle curette, taking that cap off. And there we are in the frontal sinus ostium area. So this is um, a draft 2A uh, surgery. There's a lot of high dissection above the ostium. And once I've done all this, I'll, I don't even start, you know, counting the supraboolar cells because I just come along the skull base, um, cut through sharply over here. We have to be very careful as we do this posterior dissection to understand where your anterior ethmoidal artery will be, which is a space behind the frontal ostium area. And then I do a clean dissection of the lamina papyracea and the skull base. And there's that sagittal ridge we talked about. And uh, that's that. So I think um, that's how I would approach it. There are certainly other revision procedures, uh, which I don't think um, in the interest of time, uh, we will have uh, that. But certainly that's worth discussion. Um, in terms of how I approach my um, lothrops, I now try to do um, inside out approaches, which is uh, very helpful when you have narrow uh, frontal recesses and you can't really go inside out in them. And the best thing to do about it is just go from a lateral and inferior part of the dissection. And then we start drilling out the floor first, remove all the 
backbone of the entire floor from one orbit to the other. Um, and then um, this uh, is very helpful in avoiding um, the bloody um, aspects of an uh, inside out approach where you're actually drilling from inside the sinus to the outside. And, um, and then I also like to graph these modified low trip approaches. So I'd just like to summarize by saying that surgery is technically challenging, but it's certainly one of the most inter interesting aspects of my practice. And I do a lot of uh, extensive cancer operations. I think that the frontal sinus is where you are truly tested in terms of your technique and your abilities as a surgeon and how you handle tissue and how you challenge yourself in understanding the anatomy and preserving structure and function. And with that, I uh, want to thank um, all the organizers. There are many people in my life who do a conference every year. This is from uh, about six years ago when we were lucky to have um, Valerie Lund and um, Heinz Stumberger uh, along with Klaus Parker, um, uh, along with several other national leaders and researchers and Dr. Bellotti in the same year. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss some of what I've learned with you all. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Devyani. That was a wonderful lecture. Beautiful to watch your videos and the concept of uh, frontal sinus surgery. So endoscopic uh, frontal sinus surgery is one of the last frontiers and still is in the evolution of uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, it is difficult and it is slightly risky to the patient and it's likely to result in high failure if one is not properly trained and if one does not stick to the principles. So uh, we have been again very fortunate to have been uh, uh, explained by you in such a lucid manner about the anatomy, the surgical techniques, and uh, you sharing your pearls uh, with us. Uh, I like the personification of frontal sinus to the Grand Canyon. That slide was uh, <laughs> very good, actually. Uh, yeah, and so, so thank you very much. And um, as very professionally you stuck to the time, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My, my honor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Himanshu. And uh, I'm sorry that I did not introduce Dr. Himanshu. Uh, uh, Dr. Himanshu is a professor and head of the Department of ENT at uh, Army Research and Referral Hospital, New Delhi. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devani, uh, for a wonderful talk uh, on the frontal sinus. Uh, normally, in a physical conference, we would have felicitated you with the medal as well as the certificate. But since, since it is an online uh, activity, uh, we are sharing the uh, certificate online with all, uh, with all of you, and we'll definitely mail you uh, the certificate. Thank you, Dr. Devani, for uh, the talk. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, the uh, next uh, speaker... The... <laughs> Dr. Sunil, uh, can you mute yourself? Hello, okay. Dr. Sunil, please mute yourself. Okay, okay. 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 So, uh, the... Uh... Yeah. Uh... Uh, okay, uh, Himanshu, just a minute. Uh, I will just introduce uh, the award. We can't hear you, Dr. Ravi. Just a minute. Uh, so. so the next is the uh, Dr. Prem Kakkar oration. I just wanted to tell something about Dr. Prem Kakkar. Uh, Dr. Prem Kakkar uh, literally was a very tall man. And you see, the, uh, he was a giant in the field of EMT. And uh, he was uh, honored with uh, honorary FRCS and he was uh, FACS and 
uh, MS ENT from Patna, and he was awarded Padma Shri. Uh, he uh, was head of the department of ENT Malana Medical College, and later he retired as medical superintendent of the Loknath Hospital. So, in the memory of Dr. Prem Kakkar, we have uh, this oration, and this oration will be delivered by uh, Dr. K K Thanakappan. So, I invite Dr. Himanshu to please uh, introduce Dr. K K Thanakappan. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Krishna Kumar Thanakappan. Dr. Krishna Kumar Thanakappan is one of the few MCA approved MCH teachers. I've heard a lot about him, but uh, I'm, I think I met him today for the first time. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Thankappan has is an alumni of BJ Medical College. He did his MS ENT from there. And then is MCH in head and neck surgery, onco surgery in Amrita Institute of Medical Science, where he is presently professor and uh, head of the head and neck surgery department. He did his advanced fellowship in uh, US, robotic uh, head and neck surgery in Korea. So he's well traveled. He's been exposed to all the world and the newer techniques. He won the Young Investigator Award at the Indian Cooperative Oncology Network. And he has got numerous publications in national and international journals. He is also author of a couple of books which I recommend uh, all the residents should read. Uh, Dr. Krishnakuma, the stage is all yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Himanshu, uh, Dr. Ravi, and uh, Dr. Isha Singh and other organizers. Let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, I hope you all could uh, see my screen and uh, hear me properly. Uh, so I'm indeed uh, honored uh, to do this oration in the name of uh, one of the giants in, in the ENT field, uh, Dr. Uh, Kakkar, sir. And uh, the topic given to me is uh, what is new in uh, head and neck cancers. Before that, before coming to what is new, Let's see what is old in head and neck cancers. This was a paper that was published in 1908 in the BMJ journal titled Cancer of the Mouth in Southern India with an analysis of 209 uh, operations and uh, uh, comprising of uh, many different cases Thankappan, you're, you're mute. You can unmute yourself, please. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So before coming to what is new in all or in uh, head and neck cancers, let me talk something about what is old in uh, head and neck cancers. Uh, this was a paper that was published in the BMJ in uh, 1908, uh, talking about the, uh, one surgeon, Dr. Fels, experiences uh, in dealing with the oral cavity cancer. Uh, and uh, he talks about dealing with 346 buccal cancer, 68 lower jaw, 5 upper jaw, 18 tongue, and 21 lip cancers. The uh, the Publication is from a particular hospital like uh, London Missionary Society Hospital in Travancore uh, called Neyur Hospital now in Kanyakumari district near Tivandrum. And uh, the paper goes like this. In South India, practically every native, high and low, male and female, chews using a mixture of arachnid, beetle leaf, tobacco and sleek lime. The quid is hardly ever out of the mouth except when eating, and every native retires to rest with the quid tucked into the cheek, and a favorite site for the cancer to originate is just the spot where the quid lies. In most part of South India, buccal cancer does not appear to be as prevalent as the Southwest Coast. 
This observation often puzzled me and the only fact that seemed to offer a possible explanation, namely one which runs counter to the present current of cancer pathology was that whilst in other parts, the plain dried tobacco leaf is used. In Travancore, the shopkeeper keeps his tobacco in a thick black syrup prepared from crude sugar and then spreads the leaves on the mat by the roadside to dry. Thus, by the time the leaf is used, it's a black sticky mass full of saccharomyces and other low forms of vegetable life. Two more interesting cases in the same paper. In one case of excision of the tongue, about 12 hours after the operation, the patient, hearing that someone was meddling with his property, got out of the bed, went into the next room and secured his belongings and got back to the bed without mishap. In another case, in which case the whole tongue was removed with more than the average loss of blood, the patient walked off to his village some miles distant on the fourth day without asking leave. In another extensive low jaw excision in which all the soft tissues of the cheek except the skin were removed with the jaw and a mass dissected out from the pterygoid region, the patient was found the same evening sitting up in the bed drinking rice water freely. Interesting, is it? That was the experience uh, in, from 1908 from this particular hospital, uh, which was established by Nelden Missionary Society. And that hospital was started in 1838. And the hospital is still uh, there, uh, uh, having around uh, 400 beds and uh, with an international cancer center uh, in uh, Kanyakumari district, which is very close to Trivandrum. So this is an old hospital, and this is a new hospital. And with that, let me move on to my topic, what is new in hernic cancers? Hernic cancers comprise 10% of cancers worldwide. Histology, more than 90% is squamous cell carcinoma. And these are the different subsides and uh, sites and subsides of hernic uh, uh, cancers, starting from the dura to the pleura. Overall, 57.5% of global hernic cancers occur in Asia, especially in India, and 30% of all cancers in males comprises hernic cancers, and over 2 lakh cases of hernic cancers are detected per year. This is a chart showing the top cancers in India, and hernic comes the topmost among the males in blue, while in females it is a cervical cancer. And here, right, again, another map showing countries with high incidence of mortality from oral cancer. And here you can see India in the red. So the standard management of adrenal cancer in early stage is a single modality with either surgery or radiotherapy. In advanced stage, it is combined modality. That, that means a surgery followed by radiotherapy or organ preservation regimens of uh, radiotherapy or chemo radiotherapy, and later, if required, uh, salvage surgery. In one third of the patients present with this and stages one and two, and we can get curative results in 70 to 90 percent. Two third of the patients, however, present in advanced stages with 40 to 80 percent local recurrence and 10 to 30 percent distant disease. The etiology is usually smoking, alcohol, tobacco, betel nut, and submucous fibrosis. But now we have a new player, the human papilloma virus or HPV. This is a paper published in Lancet titled HPV-Associated Hedonic Cancer, a Virus-Related Cancer Epidemic. HPV is mainly associated with the oropharyngeal cancers, the tonsil and base of tongue, and it accounts for about 70% of oropharyngeal cancers in USA. There is no definite Indian data. It happens in young males. And uh, the age is usually young, while in HPV negative tumors, it is usually elderly. Performance status is good, and they usually have an altered sexual habits, while usually the HPV negative tumors are, uh, have alcohol and smoking habits. Cystic large adenopathy, and uh, the pathology is usually poorly differentiated or basaloid squamous cell carcinoma. And this is a paper published by Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi uh, in an Indian perspective about uh, HPV. And they say the, the incidents vary in different parts of the India. But in general, the human papilloma virus related uh, cancers is less in India. But it may not be the scene maybe after 10 years. Uh, 
This also published by our group, showing a positive correlation of HPV infection with oral tongue cancer. But good thing about this uh, virus and virus-related oropharyngeal cancer is that it those tumors will have a good prognosis. Kenang's famous paper says that the tumor HPV status is a strong and independent favorable prognostic factor for oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. This is an, a Kaplan-Meier curve showing the overall survival. The HPV positive tumors have a good uh, overall survival or a better overall survival than HPV negative uh, tumors. And what's happening new in imaging? We all know about the anatomical imaging, the CT scan and the MRI scan. But now we have moved on to the functional imaging, that is the PET scan. Uh, it's a functional and molecular imaging method. Malignant cells has increased uh, glucose metabolism and FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose is given intravenously and it's taken up by the cells. And the cancer cells are metabolically, metabolically more active and they take up more nucleoside, nuclear than the normal cells and they are seen lit up with more SUV values. And when we combine this uh, PET scan, <laughs> the anatomical imaging of a CT scan, that's more uh, useful. Uh, it's in herina cancers, the PET CT is useful in staging, uh, stay a carcinoma of unknown primary treatment planning, monitoring treatment response and surveillance imaging. Uh, in an unknown primary, the previous norm was to use a, do a pan endoscopy and a blind biopsy. That's prior to PET era but now it is PET-directed biopsy. This is a large patient presented with a large uh, node, and on PET scan, you can identify this small tonsillar primary, and uh, so we can do a PET-directed uh, biopsy from the tonsillar, tonsillar area in an unknown primary. It, it is also useful to you see the treatment response. This is a pre-treatment scanning and uh, mid-treatment and uh, after treatment where the tumor has responded very well. It is also useful to, as a surveillance imaging to see if there is any recurrent tumor. You can see a, a recurrent tumor lit up nicely in the PET-CT scan. Now, uh, uh, PET-CT scan is being replaced by, or uh, uh, there is also a role of PET-MRI scan, which has an excellent soft tissue contrast. There is no radiation of exposure. And uh, when it combines with the metabolic information offered by the PET, it is even more useful. Talking about the pathology and advances, the previous we just had hematoxyl, neosyl, and immunohistochemistry, but now is the era of molecular diagnostics. In head and neck cancers, high-risk HPV is a good prognostic marker. EGFR overexpression over expression is seen as a poor prognostic marker. And in case of indeterminate thyroid nodule somatic mutation testings like uh, BAFRAS, RPC genes, etc., are useful in determining whether there is a malignancy in indeterminate thyroid nodules. AGCC 8th edition, which came into uh, uh, force in 2018, has made some paradigm shift with several novel considerations with, and uh, distinct therapeutic uh, ramifications. It introduced in new TNM classifications for HPV or P16 mediated oropharyngeal carcinoma, soft tissue sarcomas, and unknown primary cervical nodes. And more than that, for our oral cavity tumors, it uh, introduced modification of T category by inclusion of depth of invasion in oral cavity squamous cell carcinoma and modified the N category by inclusion of extra nodal extension uh, in uh, the nodal staging. So what is the change in the depth of invasion? Uh, uh, horizon is drawn from the adjacent uh, mucosal basement membrane, and then a plump line is drawn towards the deepest cell, and that measures the depth of invasion. And uh, uh, previously in the GCC7, there was a terminology called a deep extrinsic muscle involvement to define T4, and that is being removed now. Genioglossus, styloglossus, hyoglossus, and palatoglossus are the extrinsic muscles. And they say, or the evidence say, the depth of invasion supersedes its. The extrinsic muscle invasion as such is difficult to assess both clinically and pathologically. 
So that's a new uh, AJCC, eighth edition oral cavity T cancer, in incorporating the depth of invasion. So we have uh, looked into this uh, particular deep extrinsic muscle involvement and we have published a paper. It's a prospective study on 87 patients uh, of oral tongue cancer where MRI was done. And we conclude that concluded that extrinsic muscles of the tongue are not deep, they are superficial muscles. And even superficial thin tumors can involve these muscles. So they need not be actually T4. And therefore this present study justified the removal of uh, extrinsic muscle involvement to define stage T4 in oral cavity. Now look at, let's look at the treatment modalities. Uh, the surgery, radiotherapy, and systemic therapy or chemotherapy. In surgery, the advances is advances are mainly in the minimal access surgery, the endoscopic endonasal skull base surgery. You heard about a beautiful talk today morning. Sentinel load biopsy and robotic surgery, and then the advances in reconstructive uh, techniques. Skull based malignancies are a heterogeneous group of tumors, unique challenge in the management with complex anatomy, proximity to critical structures, and a combined craniofacial resection and radiotherapy is a standard of care. So, anterior skull base uh, is a junction of the nasal roof and the uh, cranial cavity and requires the tumor removal requires a release from both the nasal side and the cranial side. And uh, the conventional approach was uh, com uh, uh, com had two components, a transfacial approach and a transcranial approach, which had limitations like brain retraction, injury to venous sinuses, and transfacial incisions. But endoscopic skull-based surgery has uh, removed all these limitations uh, and with excellent view and uh, complete uh, tumor removal. Now coming to management of the neck. Neck dissection is an essential part of uh, management of uh, uh, hernia cancers and mainly oral cavity cancers. In the previous year, a radical neck dissection was the norm. Uh, and then came modified radical neck dissection when we uh, tried to preserve non-lymphatic structures like the sternocleidomastoid, spinal accessory nerve, or internal jugular vein. And then came uh, selective neck dissection. Uh, shoulder syndrome was a complication of radical uh, neck dissection. Selective neck dissection preserved even uh, lymphatic levels, but it, depending on the site of the tumor. And uh, we are all proud of this paper from uh, uh, doc, the paper from Tata by Dr. Dick Cruz, which has uh, 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 showed without any confusion that uh, observation is not uh, 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 choice in case of uh, uh, management of N0 neck in oral cavity cancers because uh, elective surgery resulted in uh, uh, better overall survival compared to the wait and watch policy. But we have looked into the morbidity of the selective neck dissection and we have shown that selective neck dissection in oral cavity is not without morbidity. This is a small paper with a, a few patients, but we have shown the shoulder dysfunction was seen in 7.5% of selective neck dissection cases. And especially in patients who received adjuvant treatment will have significant scar issues, lymphedema issues, and sensory issues. So what, is, what are the options to reduce this morbidity? One option is to do a sentinel node biopsy. What is the concept of sentinel node biopsy? It is a first echelon drainage node. And if we take just that node out by a sentinel node biopsy, and we could, if we could prove that node is negative, then it, is, uh, 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 it has been shown that the lower lymphatic drainage uh, levels would be negative. So if the sentinel node is negative, we need not to complete the full neck dissection. That is the concept of sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, radioactive dye is injected uh, around the tumor in the nuclear medicine department and uh, uh, lymphocentigraphy is done preoperatively. And uh, this is a picture of the tumor and the sentinel lymph nodes. Uh, nowadays we can use a SPECT CT scan where we can also localize 
very clearly the sentinel lymph nodes and then the patient is taken into the three theater a small incision is placed and with the help of uh, intraoperative lymphocyntigraphy or gamma probe that particular node alone is taken out and subjected to the detailed pathological evaluation including steroid step sectioning and if that node is negative either by cross section on table or if it is proven after a week we if it is proven negative we need not do a full neck dissection so it is a procedure with uh, which has equal efficacy without much morbidity we have published our experience in this paper pathological evaluation of sentinel lymph nodes in oral squamous cell carcinoma and recently we saw two randomized trials one from uh, the french group and other from japanese group uh, which have shown non inferiority of this procedure compared to the elective neck dissection uh, in terms of outcomes and therefore we have adopted the sentinel lymph node biopsy in early tongue tumors especially in uh, T1, T2 tumors according to AGCC8. There's a small difference between the T1 and T2 between AGCC and AGCC, AGCC8 and 7. AGCC7, T1, T2 tumors were larger tumors up to 4 centimeter, but in AGCC8, the, uh, any tumor with depth more than 10 millimeter is now T3. So it's a much smaller subject. So, so we have adopted this sentinel biopsy in smaller tumors of uh, T1, AGCC8, T1, T2. And uh, uh, two, three days back, I saw this beautiful paper from Rajiv Sharan uh, uh, discussing the feasibility, safety, and nodal yield and learning curves in the retroauricular approach for a robotic neck dissection. That's probably one other approach where we can reduce the uh, morbidity related to the scar in, while doing a selective neck dissection. Ro uh, coming to robotic surgery, uh, da Vinci surgical robot by Intuitive is a robot that is used uh, now. It has the advantages of visualization, dexterity, precision, and surgeon ergonomics. Three-dimensional stereoscopic vision with high magnification, high definition, and surgeon-controlled camera with wristed instruments and seven degrees of freedom. No tremors, and there is availability of a fourth arm to retract. The so surgeon are, uh, is seated in a separate console, forearms on the pad and head resting on a console. Limitations are the size, the cost, the teachability, the safety concern, the lack of tactile and haptic feedback. It has applications in the oropharynx and hypopharynx, uh, thyroid and uh, neck surgery. In uh, transoral robotic surgery, uh, it is useful in the carcinoma of the tonsil, base of tongue, supraglottic larynx, and unknown primary with neck node. In unknown primary, it can be used for a mucosal resection of the base tongue uh, mucosa and where we could find the uh, primary tumor. We have uh, uh, looked into the uh, economics of uh, comparing transoral robotic surgery versus radiotherapy in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma recently, and it's a systematic re review. And we concluded that TORS can be considered a cost-effective strategy in early T-stage oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma if the addition of adjuvant therapy involving radiotherapy can be avoided. But it is interesting to note the literature have shown that around 70% of the early cancers would require adjuvant treatment. This implies the importance of case selection while considering TORS as the initial treatment modality. This was, paper was published recently in European Journal of Surgical Oncology. Robotic or endoscopic neck surgeries can be done in thyroidectomy, neck dissection, thyroglossal cyst excisions, submandibular gland excisions, and neck schwannomas can be either carbon dioxide assisted or gasless approach. Axillary or a post-auricular approach can be done. Robotic or endoscopic approaches can be utilized. Advantages are the hidden cosmetic scar, avoids some morbidity related to the scar, especially when associated with radiotherapy, it's more precise and magnified. We have done only three cases of endoscopic thyroidectomy uh, in benign cosmetic indications, patient motivated and one case, is of, one case of endoscopic selective neck dissection. And this is a case of the thyroid, the preoperative and the postoperative neck and the hidden uh, scar. But we found that it, it may not be a good approach in malignancies because the precision was a little less. And so we moved on to robotic thyroidectomy where we have done about 30 cases till now through a post-auricular approach. Again, this is a preoperative and a postoperative neck 
scar, especially useful in young ladies who presented with smaller thyroid nodules. And the scar hidden uh, behind the ear by the hair. And we have published uh, our experiences in initiating the robotic thyroid program in one or two papers. And uh, next thing is about reconstructive surgery. Microvascular free flaps is one most important advance which has uh, brought in significant uh, improvement in the outcomes of uh, head and neck cancer surgery. This is the radial cancer of the tongue where a radial forearm flap was used for the reconstruction. And another larger case of uh, a CA tongue reconstructed with an anterolateral thigh flap. And another small case uh, used where the reconstruction was done with a lateral arm flap. We have published the lateral arm free flap experience. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, series of lateral arm free flaps for oral tongue reconstruction published in annals of uh, plastic uh, surgery. Uh, we have also tried functional tongue, tongue reconstruction. This is a case of the total glossectomy involving all, almost the whole of the tongue and uh, where we did a two flap, two free flaps, one a gracilis free flap that is hitched between the mandible and the hyoid bone. And then we went on to take the gastromental flap based on a, a gastroepiploic artery pedicle, endoscopically harvested. And uh, this is the outcome in a total glossectomy using a gastromental flap. This again was published in oral oncology, our experience of gastromental free flap for the reconstruction of uh, tongue defects. Classification of uh, uh, glossectomy defects is an interesting uh, thing which we recently introduced. There was no classification for glossectomy defects until recently, which was validated in patients. So we looked into the volume of the defect and the location of the defect, and we found that they predicted the speech and uh, uh, we, we proposed a classification and that we found that this classification correlated with the, the speech outcome and uh, swallowing outcomes. The speech outcome was published in a paper in the International Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and uh, the swallowing outcomes was published in the Dysphagia Journal. So what is the classification? Uh, the, according to the volume, it is divided into four classes, class one, two, three, and four. One is uh, uh, less than one, up to one third, two is one third to half, then up to two third and near total glossectomy. And according to the uh, location, the lateral tongue defects, sulcus defects and tip defects. Base of tongue is it's just mentioned. It's not uh, part of the classification. Then we have four classes, one, two, three, and A, uh, four. A is L alone, B is L and tip, and C is L and sulcus or LTS, lateral tip and sulcus and of class one and class four does not have subclasses because it is either does not require any class uh, reconstruction or there is no subclass and class two and three is again divided into a b c subdivisions so that's a classification of a uh, glossectomy defects maxillary reconstruction is a challenging field uh, prosthetic reconstruction uh, was the norm in previous days and we have published our experience of orbital floor reconstruction with the free flaps. This is a case of maxillectomy, type 3 Brown's classification reconstructed with fibula. We are fortunate to have it uh, published on the front page of a head and neck journal a few years ago. We have also introduced a TFL ICIO flap, which is a, key, which is a flap, a complicated flap with a dual pedicle for a, a reconstruction of the. Uh, orbital eccentration defects. I'm not getting to the details of it. And we have even placed a fibula for the cervical spinal reconstruction following a chordoma ex uh, uh, excision. Coming to the uh, radiotherapy and systemic therapy, organ preservation approaches are the norm now. The VA trial and the RTOG 9111 trial study has shown that concurrent chemo radiotherapy is now the best option for organ preservation. Intensity modulated radiotherapy using multiple beams, multiple segments with each beam. Radiation dose can be given highly conformal. It permits dose escalation, decreases the morbidity, and improves the flexibility and precision. Critical structures can be spared, brain, spinal cord, parotid glands. It's very useful in nasopharynx, PNS, and skull base 
cases. And this is a conventional plan and an IMRT plan sparing the uh, parotid uh, glands. And moving further, we have cyber knife, tomotherapy, and proton beam therapy. Uh, this is a uh, slide showing the details of a tomotherapy system. And onboard imaging verification can be done with uh, much precision, can correct the day-to-day -day treatment setup uncertainties, and it's useful in skull-based malignancies, PNS, mesopharynx, and oropharynx malignancies. And cyber knife for uh, smaller tumors, and this is uh, where we can deliver high dose per fraction, usually only one to five fractions, useful in oligometastatic settings, paragangliomas, acoustic schonomas, and meningiomas. In acoustic schonomas, especially if surgery will cause hearing loss. This is a setup of a, a cyber knife at our hospital. And chemotherapy, Cisplatin was the previous norm, norm and paclitaxel. Uh, and off late, we are added the uh, biological treatment or targeted therapy. EGFR is expressed in 80% of head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. Tetuximab is a monoclonal antibody against EGFR. And there are publications which have shown the efficacy of. Uh, 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 cetuximab for squamous cell carcinoma of the neck with survival benefits. Immunotherapy has come far ahead. Immune checkpoint inhibitors are used. The new drugs are pembrolizumab and nivolumab. I'm not going to the mechanism details, but especially useful in uh, larger uh, uh, palliative care uh, tumors as of now. Before I conclude, I have to, I, I will just uh, uh, talk about the three characteristics of head and neck cancers. The first thing is that it is preventable. We started the presentation uh, with some details uh, with a paper from uh, Trivandrum. And uh, all of you know about this paper also titled Trivandrum Oral Cancer Screening Study, which has shown the effect of screening on oral cancer mortality in Kerala a cluster randomized control trial, which has shown oral visual screening can reduce the mortality in high-risk individuals and has potential for preventing at least 37,000 oral cancer deaths worldwide every year. So we don't need any uh, specialized or uh, mechanized gadgets to detect uh, oral cancers early, just open the mouth and see. Visual oral inspection is helpful to prevent or the mortality related to oral cancer. So head and neck cancer, oral cancer is preventable. We have looked at again to the cost effectiveness of oral cancer screening approaches by visual examination. This is again is a systematic review published recently in Head and Neck. And it concluded that the majority of the studies reported that oral cancer screening is a cost effective strategy, especially in opportunistic and high risk setting. The second point is that it is curable. Stage one and two tumors, oral tumors have a five-year survival rate of 80 to 90%, and advanced stages have a five-year survival rate of 40 to 50%. There is a myth among general people that when we get a cancer, it cannot be cured. But that's not the case in head and neck cancers. If we can detect early, we can nearly cure them in most of the cases. Where if we achieve a five-year survival rate of 80 or 90 percent, the chances of coming back, the tumor coming back after five years is very, very less, equivalent to cure. So this message has to be go to the, uh, the general people, and this can be achieved only by a multidisciplinary uh, approach. And the third point about head and neck cancer is, is in India, it's that it is learnable. We have MCI approved MCH in head and oncology in about 10 or nine or 10 centers across India. And there are many advanced fellowships available about in uh, more than 20 centers across India. The junior uh, uh, people, uh, trainees should utilize these uh, centers to gain and learn uh, how head and neck cancers can be treated. I also uh, uh, urge the young crowd to read our book titled Basic Concepts in Head and Neck Surgery and Oncology. 
The primary focus of the book is to simplify the concepts of hedonic surgery and oncology into day-to-day -day clinically applicable information. It's not meant as a detail, it's not meant as a detailed textbook, and the information is distilled into what is essential for evidence-based practice. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Dr. Venkapan. It was a very comprehensive lecture. It was a vast topic, but nicely concise and explained by you. Thank you. It started with the head and neck cancers, how they are menace in our society because of different habits since long. And uh, then you uh, came to the various uh, recent advances. Uh, HPV, which is very important in our times when we are doing our residency, any patient who was young, who had oropharyngeal cancer, was considered to be having bad prognosis. So the tables have turned completely now. Uh, then uh, you talked about the PET scan, the indications in carcinoma of unknown primary, the response to the treatment, the recurrence, and how the PET MRI is now evolved because it has got better soft tissue delineation and there are no radiation effects. Then you talked about the molecular diagnostics, uh, again, about the HPV, EGFR, and molecular diagnostic in the thyroid cancers. Importantly, you talked about the changes in the eighth edition, how uh, the depth of invasion uh, is important and extranodal extension, which was an, an earlier considered fallacies for the TNM staging. Now uh, it has been more or less covered by the new staging which will have impact on the treatment as well as uh, follow-up of the patient. You, uh, in all the, you are not talking from your hat, you had experience, you had published papers and you had published papers about the extrinsic muscle Im involvement, which is rightly so, it is so superficial muscle, so it should not be staged as T4. Then you talked about the treatment uh, modalities. Uh, especially the uh, the surgical modalities, the selective neck dissection, how uh, and you have compared with the sentinel node biopsy. Uh, I, I it was an eye opener. So maybe things will change and we'll shift from uh, selective neck dissection to even less morbid procedure of sentinel node biopsy in near future. Uh, you talked about the robotic surgery and its cost effectiveness if it is used only as a single modality. So that was uh, good. And then uh, the beautiful reconstruction with three flaps. The classification of glossectomy uh, was indeed uh, excellent. And you had published this. I, it, it was again a new thing for me uh, and how the classification affects the speech and swallowing uh, post-treatment. And then you showed uh, very good reconstruction of maxilla and the orbit. You have talked about the radiotherapy, IMRT, tomotherapy, gamma knife, cyber knife, targeted therapies such as cetuximab and immunotherapy. And the take home message is that indeed it's uh, head and neck malignancy is preventable, it is curable, and it is learnable. Thank you very much, Dr. Thankapun, for a beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu, for summarizing it. Uh, I think Dr. KK has uh, delivered a, a very excellent uh, oration and he has actually uh, told about the management of oral cancer in a very concise manner. Uh, I am delighted to honor him with Dr. PK Kakkad oration. Uh, we will send you the certificate online and I'm very thankful to Dr. Tanak Kappan for accepting it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the next uh, session is the poster award session and we are going to start with the uh, poster presentations and we already have the judges uh, uh, in the auditorium. Uh, I will introduce the judges. Uh, we have a very eminent uh, professor from uh, RML Hospital and Atul Bihari uh, Institute of Medical Sciences, Dr. Ashok Kumar. Uh, he is working as professor at RML Institute and uh, he is a very uh, well-known cochlear implant surgeon. And uh, I had the privilege with, uh, with, uh, uh, of working with him at Mulanazar uh, Medical College also. 
next we have dr manish gilotra dr manish gilotra is additional professor at post graduate institute of child and uh, and hedenic uh, uh, center uh, at noida so uh, within this introduction i will uh, ask the first presenter to come on the dais and present his poster डॉक्टर विश्वानी खन्ना Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Dr. Vishwani Kumar, and I will be presenting my poster on uh, the mangiomas of sediment in India. Uh, we had two cases of the mangioma in uh, our OPD who had come. The first case was of a two-year-old female, which she presented to the OPD with the left side swelling in the cheek, uh, which was present since birth, and on examination. There was a single with you non-tender swelling, which was extending from the left, uh, which was extending the left side of the face, from the left angle of mouth up to the left side of tragus, and it was extending inferiorly to the mandible. The surface of the swelling was smooth. It was and the overlying scale and mucosa was uh, purplish in color, and uh, over the skin there were engorged vessels which could be seen. Uh, we had got uh, MRI done, uh, MRI of the face and neck uh, done as an investigation. And the MRI revealed the dilated vessels which were involving the left masseter and the left thyroid muscle. And uh, we can see that image C, uh, the coronal section showed isotope uh, hyper intense lesions with multiple separations in the left side of the cheek. Uh, the management, uh, we managed this case uh, conservatively and uh, tablet propanolol was given 10 milligram once a day for three months and along with this we had given uh, oral prednisolone in tapering doses and every two months uh, the follow-up was kept. Uh, her, uh, after two months, the swelling has now decreased to one third of its size and the patient has no other complications. The second case, uh, the second case uh, was a little different. It had a different approach. The second case was of a 10-year-old male coming to the OPD with a left-sided uh, neck swelling, which was present in three months. And it was associated with restricted movements. The patient had previous history of uh, treatment from some other hospital, and uh, he was managed conservatively over there. He was given injection pleomycin. Two doses were given. The first, after the first dose was given, the size had decreased in, initially, but after the second dose, the swelling uh, started to increase in size and it became hard. So. Uh, FNAC was repeated and it was suggestive of hematoma. On examination, 
the swelling was single, it was ovoid and extending from the left angular mandible up to the midline and inferiorly it was up, extending up to the hyoid bone. The surface of the swelling was smooth, round with round margins. The swelling was mobile and fluctuant, non-tender and non-reductible. Uh, the CT scan which was done, uh, was done, uh, it showed the uh, it showed uh, a cystic mass with uh, septation and uh, in the left retromandibular area, and there was no definite uh, enhance, soft tissue enhancement pain. Uh, this patient was managed surgically uh, because of uh, two reasons. Firstly, the swelling was uh, large, and secondly, the uh, patient had insisted on, on patient's uh, will, the surgical management was done. And post operatively, histopathology showed features suggestive of a cavernous hemangioma of the submandibular gland. And the follow up was uh, done after one week and one month, which showed that the patient had uh, been, become asymptomatic and there was complete relief of the operative symptoms. Coming to the discussion, uh, hemangiomas, as we know, are very common benign lesions of. Uh, infancy and childhood. However, due to parental uh, worries, a lot of times the, so the approach to treatment may change. That is why uh, in the first case, we have taken up uh, the medical management being conservative. And in the second uh, case where the parents wanted a complete removal of the swelling, we had taken a uh, surgical approach. You know, yes, what exactly the the has been proved uh, to uh, Next thing is here. Um, it acts on the. Uh, what type of So it is a little. Yeah, thank you. Go for it. Next is uh, Dr. Ashwin Bhaskar.
Good morning, uh, respected uh, jury members, uh, their delegates. Today, I, Dr. Ashwin Basarthan, will be introducing you to a rare coexistence and unusual combined presentation of autosclerosis with isolated ossicular anomaly, that is, monocrudal stickies. Uh, we have found that autosclerosis as well as congenital middle layer anomalies can present, uh, can have a similar presentation that is with uh, conductive hearing loss with intact tympanic membrane. Monocrudal stephys cases are uh, very sparsely reported uh, and they are usually reported in early ages. Here we present a rare coexistence of stepidio-vestibular autosclerosis and uh, that is uh, stepidio-autosclerosis and monocrudal stephys in a 34-year-old uh, female. We encountered a 34-year-old female patient in our uh, OPD who, uh, who had a complaint of bilateral hearing loss, uh, left ear more than right, uh, which gradually progressed over a duration of two years. She had no history of ear discharge, trauma to ear, previous ear surgery, or any similar illnesses in her family. On her, uh, on her examination, we found that she had bilateral uh, tympanic membrane intact and healthy. On tuning fork test, Renal test was negative for 256 hertz and 512 hertz and positive for 1024 hertz in both ears. Weber was lateralized to left ear. Bilateral airborne conduction thresholds were comparable to the exam. On PTA, bilaterally, moderate conductive hearing loss with a deep at 2 kHz was found. And on impedance, a right ear showed AD curve, whereas left ear showed A curve and bilateral uh, stepidial reflex was absent. We diagnosed her provisionally with bilateral autosclerosis and after taking a proper consent, we planned her for uh, left ear uh, exploded in panodon. Interoperatively, we got something new. Interoperatively, the, uh, we found that anterior thrust of stapes was absent along with uh, there was presence of circumferential stepidovestibular joint, joint fixation due to autosclerosis. Posterior, uh, uh, for this finding, uh, we, ma uh, we managed this case further with uh, fracturing the posterior crust and removal of the uh, stapes supra uh, suprastructure, followed by uh, placement of Teflon piston of size 4.5 mm into 0.6 mm. Immediate uh, hearing improvement was noted by the patient and we confirmed, uh, confirmed the same intraoperatively by tuning fork test. We followed this case for six months and found that she had a stable, improved hearing results. Hearing improvement was also confirmed by PTA, which showed closure of airborne gap, which was present preoperatively. And discussion, autosclerosis is an autosomal dominant osteodystrophic disease of the otic capsule, where foci of new software and more vascular bone replace the avascular endochondrial bone. Congenital abnormalities, uh, they are divided into two major as well as minor. In minor abnormalities usually involve stapes, incus, malleus, old window, and round window. And if there are abnormalities of EAC as well as pinna, then they will be classified into major. <coughs> stapes and incudo uh, stapedial complex, they are most commonly involved structures causing congenital conductive hearing loss. Middle ear anomalies may coexist with the autosclerosis and most commonly anomalies of the lenticular processes have been found. The embryologic cause for stephys supra, uh, suprastructure fixation may be because of the dual origin of its development. The embryologic basis for mild development of this stephys uh, suprastructure, mono, that is monocrural or, or columnar variant, depends on the relationship of the stepidal artery and the developing stephys. Uh, I would conclude this case with 
that uh, we've seen that congenital stibis anomaly with otosclerosis is a rare coexistence where we can proceed with uh, exploratory tympanotomy, which would prove beneficial in a uh, uh, in diagnostic way as well as therapeutically. Thank you. So we operated left ear. Webus was uh, lateralized was left. Ear. Sir, what method do you use for touching the pura? Uh, sir, we uh, like interoperatively we did uh, how, how, how do you uh, Sir, we had a uh, micro scissors with that we wanted to. Scissors, no use for micro touching. You have prodromic scissors? Sir? You have prodromic scissors? Yes, sir, prodromic scissors we had. How, how do you? Uh, Get the hole in the foot plate? Sir, uh, with the uh, yes, uh, perforator. Uh, so we did a. Uh, uh, what size perforator? Uh, sir, a uh, point, uh, uh, point uh, 6 mm. So you have used the piston of 0.6 mm? Yes, sir. So sir, sorry. Yes, sir. 0.8 mm, then uh, we placed 0.6 mm. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yesterday, uh, yeah. during paper presentation, I came and asked you, yeah. uh, sir, regarding the topic change. Yeah. No, we will not allow any topic. I was thinking that it is a misprint or something. Maybe what is being written with us? Is not present here topic. Is there a question? Is there a question? Is there a question? Next is Dr. Meghna Janardhan. Very good morning. A very good morning to all the respective uh, seniors present here. Today, I am here to give a glimpse of a rare carcinoma of the submandibular gland, that is the mammary analog of secretory carcinoma. The secretory carcinoma is a rare cerebral gland tumor, which has been recently added in the WHO classification of head and neck tumors. Most of the carcinomas has been located in the parotid gland, and some were reported in the minor salivary gland and submandibular gland. The clinical behavior of the secretory carcinoma ranges from the slowly growing tumors that can in infrequently recur after surgical resection to very aggressive tumors that can cause widespread metastasis. It has been caused by the recurrent balanced chromosomal translocation between the 12, 15 uh, chromosomes and 13 and 25 chromosomes. Okay, uh, 
uh, Inna Institute of Female, 23 year old female presented for the lump complaints of a lump in the sub left submandibular region, which has been uh, present for greater than two years. On examination, we found that there's around 2.5 to 2.5 centimeter globular swelling present in the left submandibular region, which was non tender mobile. On uh, CT, which uh, it revealed an abnormal round hypotense lesion of about 15 diameter, 15 mm diameter, which has been seen in the posterior part of the sub left submandibular gland, which was projecting cordially. And it had ill defined streaky infiltrates overlying the subcutaneous fat tissue along the inferior surface. Pre operatively, FNAC was done, which showed to be a pleomorphic adenoma. Hence, we decided to excise the gland. Excision of the gland was done as a definite management of it. But in the final histopathological examination, it revealed out to be a secretary carcinoma. In histo, uh, immunohistochemical staining, uh, it showed diffu uh, diffusely positive for S100 and CK5, 6, and 7, and focal positive for GC, DFP15. Because of the low grade morphology, uh, with complete excision was recommend recommendation. A uh, close observation was done for the patient with no any additional treatment. And the patient reports that she is doing well with no specific concern regarding her tumor. Uh, in 2010, Skalova described the secretory carcinoma of the salivary gland through the case series of 16 patients. Histologically, this resembles the secretory carcinoma of the breast and has a variable architecture ranging from back-to-back -back tubules or a microcyst on papillae or the macrocyst. The high HC marking being very useful technique in distinguishing the secretory carcinoma and other uh, from any other salivary gland tumors. It particularly shows positivity, dual positivity for mammoglobulin and S100. Furthermore, molecular studies should be performed for any proper management of this tumor. But in our case, it showed only diffusely positive for S100 and focal positivity for GCDF15. And further, treatment depends on the staging of the tumor at the time of the diagnosis, the tumor histology, and the molecular characteristics. Uh, to conclude, I can say that the mammary analog of secretory carcinoma is regarded as one of the rare entities affecting the head and neck salivary glands. And it has been diagnosed through typical histopathological features and hemohistochemical analysis, and further, which has been confirmed by molecular studies. But the because of the uh, uh, availability of molecular studies is not present everywhere and it also demands a high cost. This rare disease should be diagnosed very cautiously by its typical histopathology. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, like three monthly follow up we are doing and we got a CT, repeat CT done. There is no evidence of recurrence. Of any tumor. We didn't get anything. Just CT for the. How long back was it? It was operated in February. Ah, yes, sir, 21. Next is Dr. Vibhati. Good morning, everyone. Today, I, Dr. Vibha Singh, will be presenting my poster on the topic to evaluate the effect of COVID on osteomyelitis, a case series. COVID-19 is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, which originated in Wuhan province of China in December 2019. 
and has spread globally thereafter. Uh, it has caused an unprecedented global health crisis. Osteomyelitis is an inflammatory process of bone and its marrow content. It is an opportunistic infection, which occurs as a complication of an underlying disorder. The uh, maxilla is a primary facial bone. The maxillary necrosis is uh, less common as compared to mandible due to its rich vascular supply. The opportunistic infection due to amplification of uh, the COVID-19 has caused uh, several deep percussion marked by immunological changes, hyper hypercoagulability, ischemic uh, phenomena, the need to use of high dose of corticosteroids, the factors which are directly linked to the de uh, development of osteomyelitis. The present study aims to analyze the likely repercussion of COVID-19 in musculoskeletal system. Methodology, all the patients presenting in the ENT department as a suspected case of osteomyelitis were enrolled in the study. A detailed history, general physical examination and complete ENT examination was done. After detailed informed consent, patients were admitted. Patients underwent complete blood workup, radiological investigations and biopsy from the representative area. After clinical con uh, confirmation of osteomyelitis, patients were started on IV antibiotics according to culture sensitivity. After stabilizations, patients were taken up for debridement under GA or local. Patients underwent regular debridement and endoscopic evaluation. After three to four weeks of IV antibiotics and clinical care, patients were discharged and followed up in OPD. Results, out of the three patients admitted over the course of six months, all of them had uh, maxillary osteomyelitis. Two of them had a history of COVID positive status before the onset of symptoms. One of them had uh, COVID flu-like symptoms, but the patient never got tested. All the three patients were negative on TB workup, other immunocompromised status, and other rheumatological workup. After regular follow-up of the patients, one had showed improvement and showed no signs of recurrence. Two of them have showed recurrence and are under further evaluation. Discussion. COVID-19 infection leads to endothelial dysfunction, which generates excessive thrombin and fibrolysin. This shutdown leads to a state of hypercoagulability, which associated with a hypoxia can cause thrombosis by increased blood viscosity. Also, prolonged bed rest can cause the thrombin volume. Glucocorticoids have also shown uh, to be a factor in causing osteomyelitis due to its uh, stimulation of osteoblastic uh, apoptosis and increased osteoblastic survival. Few studies have demonstrated osteomyelitis of foot, uh, palm, umbilical cord with COVID-19, the presence of local vascular thrombosis, microcirculatory metabolic and immune system disorder uh, may have contribution uh, to osteomyelitis. Conclusion, COVID-19 associated osteomyelitis ha have a protracted course leading a longer hospital stay, longer course of IV antibiotics, and an aggressive treatment. Patients' uh, treatment with COVID-19 should be followed up in OPD for prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Use of anticoagulants such as unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin should be considered. Uh, the post-COVID patients showed uh, continued uh, process after sequestration at the margin of healthy bone. The effect of COVID-19 on osteomyelitis can be a future prospective study. Uh, the pictures here shows a patient, one of the three patients who presented with a discharging sinus over left maxilla. On uh, intraoperatively, we removed, we underwent a local debridement. We removed all the sequestrum till the healthy bone was found. Thank you. Was the case of Sir, there were three patients. One patient had the, the involvement of anterior wall of the maxilla over the. Okay. So clinically, the patient present with the pain and uh, pain and swelling with loosening of tooth and uh, discharging sinuses in present. On CT scan, they will, they will be focal osteolysis, osteitis, sequestrum. On uh, histopathology, they will be a necrotic bone, inflammatory exudates, and um, sequestrum.
Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going. I'm myself, Dr. Gautam. I'm going to present a case series on implications of site of tracheostomy in penetrating neck trauma. Penetrating neck trauma is defined as an injury where platysma is placed. The incidence being five to ten percent of all trauma cases. It needs urgent airway management and neck exploration. The airway management we can be done by intubation or cricothyroidectomy or tracheostomy. Tracheostomy is done usually done in a skeletal collapse. Partial or complete transection of trachea or larynx or such any structural disruption. Roon and Christensen classified neck into three zones. Zone one from uh, clavicular and sternal notch to lower border of trachea cartilage. Zone two being from lower border of trachea cartilage to angle of mandible, and zone three being from angle of mandible to base of skull. Though zone two is the most common penetrating uh, 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 neck trauma, it is. Has less mortality because it is easily readily uh, accessible. Zone one and three has difficult uh, anatomical accessibility and has high vascular contents. The aim of our study is to overview various tracheostomy sites and its implications in penetrating neck trauma. Now coming to the cases. In case one, a 30-year male came with laceration of two by two by one centimeter. Four centimeter above suprasternal notch, and with uh, patient had subcutaneous emphysema on neck, and came with breathing difficulty. On exploration, there was a tracheal dent over three third ring with posterior wall being intact. Tracheostomy tube was inserted through the dent, and there was no alley from the sides of the tube. After seven days, uh, decanalization protocol was followed, and patient was decanalized. Fifteen days post decanalization, patient. Came with complaints of swelling over the suture wound while phonation. On radiological evaluation, there was a packet of around trachea. It was managed conservatively with uh, voices and pressure dressing. Coming to case two, a 25-year male with, came with laceration of 10 by 4 by 5 centimeter in the neck above the uh, thyroid notch. Patient came with shoulder and early was there. Hence, emergency trachea surgery was done at the site lower to the top bone. Uh, CT angiogram was done. There was no major vascular injury noted. On wound exploration, there was a fracture of hyoid bone was noted. It was saline and wound was repaired. Patient was discharged after day ten. Coming to third case, a 40 year male came with two lacerations over the neck and the patient doesn't have any signs of airway injury. Pan endoscopy was done and there was no mucous injury noted. Hence, patient was intubated and wound was exposed. On exploration, there was a linear undisplaced fracture over the thyroid cartilage was seen. Wound was repaired and the patient did not. Uh, patient was extubated. Patient did not undergo tracheostomy. Coming to discussion. In uh, first case, patient uh, tracheostomy tube was inserted through the rent as a, it is the usual site of tracheostomy and uh, there was no alley gap after uh, T tube insertion. There was post uh, post decanalization swelling. Which was managed conservatively. It may be due to alley from the stromal side by reducing subglottic pressure and pressure dressing. In second case, tracheostomy is done at the lower side to the bone, which is most commonly preferred side of tracheostomy. It is done in second to fourth tracheal range. After securing the airway, radiological evaluation was done and bone exploration was done. In third case, there was no signs of airway injury, and the patient was intubated and tracheostomy was not done. Recent studies prefer a conservative management for minor laryngeal surgery, minor laryngeal injury. Only hot sense need immediate exploration, which include airway compromise, hoarseness, stridor, shock, expanding hematoma, difficulty or painful swallowing, and neurological deficits. To conclude, minor laryngeal injuries can be managed conservatively. Tracheostomy in penetrating neck trauma helps in securing airway and allowing safe exploration. Site of tracheostomy may vary from case to case. And it is usually done at the site lower to the top bone. Thank you. So it may be due to air. Sir, so actually, it is due to air leak from the tracheostom. Ah, uh, tracheostom is rent. So we explore wound exploration was done. The subplatysma flap was elevated. On wound exploration, there was a rent was there in trachea. We just inserted the tube to the end. There was no alley cause there. Then subsequently, the emphysema was subsided. Okay. So actually, we uh, after uh, five post-operative five, 
we did endoscopic evaluation, ocular plugs and everything was complete. So just we did the strapping, pressure dressing. It was closed. Then post op day seven, the patient came again with a swelling wave formation. It may be no sir. It, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Samna Gupta, and I am presenting a case report on uh, EC cholesteatoma. Uh, uh, we had a 34 year old male who came to us in OPD with complaint of right ear discharge and decreased hearing since five years. The discharge was intermittent, yellow, non-foul smelling, non-bloody, mucoprolent and scanty with no relieving or exaggerating factors. The hearing uh, was decreasing progressively and uh, it uh, was, uh, the patient also had history of left ear uh, tympanoplasty type three done on 7th October, 2020. On examination, the right ear, uh, was seen that the EAC had a cavity in the posterior side, uh, it, uh, probably extending to mastoid, with the intact TM retracted in grade two with pass tensor. Uh, tuning curve test was done with Weber's lateralizing to the left side, and uh, Rene's was positive with the uh, 512 and 1024 on both sides. On PTA, uh, right side, the affected ear. Uh, showed mild conductive hearing loss of 25 decibels, by the left side showed the uh, mixed hearing loss. Intraoperatively, uh, on, uh, sorry, on an uh, HRCT, uh, soft tissue density was seen bilaterally in mastoid air cells, and tympanic membrane perforation was present on the left side, with an intact tympanic membrane on the right side. There was an erosion pocket present in the posterior wall of EAC. Uh, after proper evaluation, we took the patient up for surgery and planned him for a right ear modified radical mastoidectomy. Uh, intraoperatively, we saw a cholesterol sac in the posterior wall of the EAC, which was extending into the antrum, but with a clear attic and medial spaces. Uh, all the sac uh, cholesterol was removed, and uh, we concluded that uh, probably this was a case of a primary EAC cholesterol uh, which is very rare finding, and uh, since the reporting is very less, the proper incidence is not uh, present. The cholesterol of the EAC is responsible for 0 0.1 to 0.5% of autological pathology, and the etiology and pathogenesis is still poorly understood, but uh, several theories are put in the origin, including localized periostitis, inflammation, and failure in the epithelial cell clearance uh, mechanism. There is no exact frequency due to lack of literature. So, uh, so commonest is autonomia with dull aching pain. There is a uh, very less patient come up with the decreased hearing loss. Mostly come with what the hearing loss. Yes, sir, mild hearing what, loss. What is the cause of hearing loss in this patient? Uh, so we concluded that since the uh, tympanic membrane uh, was intact yeah. and middle ear spaces were clear, could be due to keratin debris present in, uh, due to the EAC cholesterol. Maybe that was the reason. Do you did try to use the uh, no, sir. We did modified radical mastoidectomy for that. The patient had uh, so a history of 
left ear, the other ear for type 3 tympanoplasty surgery done earlier. Uh, so on PT there was 25 deaths, very minimal hearing loss was there. Uh, so we follow up uh, after post-op day seven, we ask the patient for suture removal, uh, ask the patient in OPD for suture removal, then every month uh, for uh, six months and then six months ke baad, uh, then call okay, the so there have been studies showing chances of recurrence, but uh, since the sac was clear of all the cholesterol, then we just keep the patient in follow up. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll be presenting an, uh, an audit of outcomes of surgical tracheostomy in COVID-19 patients uh, done at our tertiary care center. So uh, approximately 5 to 15 percent of uh, COVID patients require intubation and subsequent mechanical ventilation. Many of these patients uh, are candidates for tracheostomy. However, uh, tracheostomy as a measure in COVID patients has been debatable. Uh, because uh, of the risk to healthcare workers who do tracheostomy, as well as poor outcomes that have been described in COVID patients. So through this audit, we wanted to address this problem. We wanted to know the clinical and uh, social de demographic factors that are associated with poor surgical outcomes, so as to plan a better, uh, uh, better, so as to plan tracheostomies better in future. Uh, Materials and methods, this was a prospective cohort study. Then from April 2020 to January 2021, we included all patients of COVID ARDS uh, who had uh, open surgical tracheostomy done by an ENT surgeon. We excluded the patients who had percutaneous tracheostomy done by an uh, uh, ICU, uh, ICU team. This uh, study was approved by the Institutional Ethics Committee and the need of informed and written consent was waived off by them. We collected data through the electronic medical records of the patients and uh, social demographic and clinical data was uh, collected, tracheostomy related complications data was collected. Our primary outcome measure was uh, 30 day tracheostomy, uh, 30 day mortality following tracheostomy and association with potential uh, prognostic risk factors like age, gender, neurological disease, presence of diabetes, hypertension, presence of sepsis, and the timing of tracheostomy. Our secondly, secondary outcome measure was uh, perioperative complications and the risk of infection to the operating team. Data analysis, we uh, analyze the data through the standard statistical variables like uh, mean, mode, median, and uh, comparisons were performed using Fisher's exact test. P-value of uh, less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. Our results, uh, during the study duration, 51 patients underwent tracheostomy, and uh, 24 out of these 51 patients were actually weaned off from ventilator. Patients' uh, clinical demographic variables have been uh, tabulated in Table 1. Uh, as you can see, uh, 52 is the median age of the patients, and the range uh, is 23 to 83 years. Out of the uh, total 51 patients, 32 patients were male and 19 were female. Amongst the comorbidities, the most common comorbidity was neurological disease in 26 patients. 17 patients had hypertension and 15 had diabetes mellitus. 
Indications for tracheostomy, the most common indication was prolonged ventilation in 47 out of 51 patients. Uh, presence of sepsis was there in 25 patients. Uh, these were the three major findings of, uh, of, my, uh, uh, of the uh, demographic variables. Uh, the presence of sepsis in 25 patients, uh, uh, indication of tracheostomy in 47 patients, it was prolonged ventilation and uh, in 26 patients, neurological disease was simultaneously present. In table two, we can see the association between prognostic risk factors and 30-day mortality post tracheostomy. Uh, age more than 40 years uh, was associated with a poor outcome. Uh, in the second column, second row, we can see gender uh, was not significant. Uh, diabetes mellitus was not significant. Hypertension did not show any difference in mortality. A neurological disease again uh, showed more non-survivors as well as compared to survivors. Presence of sepsis was one variable which was actually statistically significant uh, and it showed poor outcome. Day of tracheostomy post intubation and day of tracheostomy post COVID-19 diagnosis did not show any poor outcome. So uh, the most common uh, intraoperative complication was bleeding, uh, which was controlled by standard conventional measures. And the 30-day mortality in patients was 66.6%. However, it was uh, not associated with tracheostomy. None of the patients had any tracheostomy-related mortality. In discussion, uh, sir, this is the largest series of uh, COVID-19 tracheostomies in India. And uh, since the patients with critical illness uh, with, due to COVID-19 induced respiratory failure carry a dismal prognosis, we intend to do a, we intended this uh, study so as to stratify the patients on uh, whom to do a, a tracheostomy and whom to avoid tracheostomy as the tracheostomy per se carries a risk to the uh, operating team. We found that uh, uh, tracheostomy in the absence of poor prognostic indicators like age more than 40 years, uh, presence of neurological disease and presence of sepsis. Mira, uh, minute late start was it? This is late start. He is right. Sir, actually, it was already one minute when, when I started. The last, last minute. Okay. Sir, uh, so uh, presence of sepsis, age more than 40 years, and presence of neurological disease was associated with a poor outcome. And so these, uh, in the presence of these poor prognostic indicators, uh, we would uh, recommend that the tracheostomy to be avoided in the first 14 days when the infectious load is high and it carries a risk to the operating team. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. sir uh, we preferred 8 to 8.5 in adults and adult males and 7 to 7.5 in adult females for ease of pulmonary toileting. Type of Sir, sir, polyvinyl chloride tracheostomy tube, the standard tracheostomy tube uh, that was available in the hospital. Sir, uh, the patients who required ventilation, all these patients actually required ventilation in the post op period, so we had to use top tubes, sir, because of the uh, need of positive and expiratory pressure. Thank you, sir. Timer is not on the laptop screen. Timer is with me. So when the timer rings, it means your time is up.
good morning everyone today i'll be presenting my poster on jaw dropping lesions which was a case series of benign lesions of mandible introduction uh, there is a low incidence of adenoid tumor that is for benign tumors it is around 300 per, per 1 lakh population and 3 per 1 lakh for malignant lesions however giant benign lesions of head and neck lesion they are associated with a significant morbidity and so we need a meticulous surgical resection and rehabilitation for these patients for a good quality of life uh, i am present the my cases were the case one it was a 20 years old female with a 12 into 10 cm swelling over the right side of the face for the last 4 years which we can see uh, on figure 1 and 2 it was then diagnosed as odontogenic keratocyst of right mandible the patient was then taken up for surgery and in the intraoperative pictures we can see on figure 9 and the postoperative specimen 10 and the patient underwent free fibular grafting followed by surgical resection case number 2 was of a 29 years old male with a history of ameloblastoma of right mandible with free fibular graft 7 years back and now patient presented with a 15 into 10 cm swelling over the left cheek for the last 9 months as we can see in figures 3 and 4 it was then diagnosed as recurrent ameloblastoma of the left mandible the patient then underwent surgical excision which we can see in diagram uh, intraoperative picture of uh, diagram 12 and 13 the patient then underwent excision followed by plating uh, so excuse me The patient then underwent surgical excision, uh, followed by plating. We can see in diagram fifteen the plate in C two. The case number three was of a fifty-two years old male who presented with pus discharge from the left side of the cheek for the last ten months following a history of road traffic accident. It was then diagnosed as osteomyelitis of the left mandible. Here we can see in the figure five, the patient then underwent segmental mandibulectomy with plating, as we can see in figure eighteen and nineteen. the preoperative pictures as of the odontogenic keratosis you can see in figure 6 that it was presenting as a lytic lesion of the lytic unilocular lesion of the right mandible and the and the ameloblastoma as we can see in figure number 8 it was presenting at a soap bubble appearance the classical soap bubble appearance of ameloblastoma and this uh, osteomyelitis mandible presented to us with a lytic lesion of the mandible the discussion part uh, the proliferative osteomyelitis of mandible also known as garis osteomyelitis it presents as a challenging lesion to treat it uh, presents uh, with onion skin thickening and swelling of the mandible lower border due to the periosteal reaction along with periapical inflammation histologically highly cellular woven bone is seen with which is arranged in parallel layers treatment includes long term antibiotics along with surgical resection ameloblastoma Uh, which is the most common odontogenic neoplasia presents as a slowly progressive swelling of the jaw and it arises from the glands of serous uh, based on the clinical radiological uh, histopathological and radiological uh, features there are four types of ameloblastoma namely solid multicystic which is also known as the classical ameloblastoma unicystic peripheral extraosseous ameloblastoma and desmoplastic ameloblastoma However, there are also two malignant categories and one other benign category of ameloblastoma. Reported cases of bilateral uh, uh, solid multicystic ameloblastoma is less than fifteen. The treatment includes surgical resection followed by rehabilitation reconstruction. Keratocystic odontogenic tumor is a benign unicystic odontogenic tumor uh, with peripheral aggra- uh, aggressive behavior. male to female ratio uh, being 1.6 is to 1 and it most commonly presents in the mandible it presents as a swelling along with pain and uh, jaw deformity uh, cyst is full of keratin lumes uh, keratocystic odontogenic tumor can present as a single lesion or it can also be associated with nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome 
The treatment includes surgical resection along with treatment with carbonized solution. The conclusion being, the, these benign lesions, they, uh, their meticulous surgical planning and excision is required to ensure good quality of life, especially in benign lesions like these. Thank you. So, so depending upon the defect size, uh, we plan uh, either we went either for plating or prefibular grafting, depending upon the size of the defect. And also, there's a patient general condition. Sir, so plating only. We went for plating. Uh, so, um, so we did not go for that. We only went for plating. So fifty-two years old. It, it was fifty-two years old. Any back? Uh, no, sir. Yet, uh, on your benches or plants, sir. So, right side cut up, left cut up, we did bleeding. Good morning, Mr. Simi. Uh, I would like to present a case of basal cell carcinoma uh, of the nose, which is a rare, rare case presentation. The basal cell carcinoma is a rare and potentially aggressive cutaneous tumor which arises from the sebaceous gland epithelium of the ocular and extraocular types. So it is mostly seen in the uh, in the ocular region in the, over the eyelid, but uh, it rarely pre presents in the extraocular regions also. And um, amongst those, a very rare area of presentation is the nose, and that to the nasal vestibule. So, uh, according to FB at all, only 19 cases of nasal and five reported cases of vestibular nasal sebaceous cell carcinomas are, have been reported till date. And uh, here we report a case of 59 year old male patient who presented to us with an ulceronodular external nasal mass, and an uncommon diagnosis of nasal sebaceous cell carcinoma was reached. So we did a partial rhinectomy and external nasal reconstruction, which I'm going to describe further. So history was, uh, the patient presented with a uh, 22 centimeter mass over the external nose, as you can see here, since six months, the, uh, developing from a two-year-old rice size mole. Uh, it, it slowly progressed to form an ulceronodular growth, which was painful and bled on touch and caused mild nasal obstruction on the right side. There was no other significant ENT and systemic complaints or family history. On examination, there was an ultra-nodular external nasal vestibule, vestibular mass around 4 to 4 centimeter. It was more on the right side, thus short of uh, the right anterior near margin, nasomaxillary groove, and the root of nose, and it was crossing the midline towards the left side. It showed a narrow distorted right anterior nares. Uh, on the diagnostic nasal endoscopy, there was a right-sided vestibular bulge which was present, causing narrowing of the nasal passage. Further inside, when we pushed the scope, the mask was seen infiltrating the and obstructing the right anterior nasal cavity. Uh, we did a radiological investigation of a contrast-enhanced CT scan of the nose and the paranasal sinuses, 
in which we found a well defined heterogeneously enhancing ultra proliferative soft tissue density gradient measuring measuring 23 into 33 into 27 cm over here centered at the anterior superior aspect of the nose involving the skin subcutaneous tissue and the anterior nares anterior nasal cavity the the bony septum and the bony uh, walls were uh, uninvolved uh now we planned the patient for a surgery we did a partial rhinectomy which was done taking the adequate margins around the tumor which included the entire cartilaginous vault with the soft tissue cover the specimen included a septal cartilage tipped bilateral ala cartilage columella along with skin and subcutaneous tissue and which was sent for histopathological examination the bony vault was uninvolved the frozen section was sent for uh, all the margins which were found uninvolved and then for reconstruction we used a bilateral parametrin forehead flap uh, reconstruction with our burns and plastic team the external nose was reconstructed with one flap providing the inner lining and the other providing a cover and the bony vault acted as a scaffold so uh, the donor side was covered with a split skin graft harvested from the thigh and the pedicle of cover flap was provided after 3 weeks and sutured appropriately under local anesthesia on one month uh, and three month follow up patient did not show any signs of uh, any recurrence or any infection over the sutures uh, post operatively patient was satisfied both functionally which was our uh, primary aim and cosmetically which was our secondary aim and there was no complaints of nasal obstruction at 10 year 10 months follow up as parabidin forehead flaps were used there uh, there has not been any contraction of the recently constructed nose on on post operative histopathology we found uh, the there were areas of uh, foamy cells with clear cytoplasm uh, uh, indicative of spacious cell and there was uh, invasion uh, into the surrounding capsule also in indicative of spacious cell carcinoma and uh, so i, I would uh, on the discussion part i would say that spacious cell carcinoma is a very rare and aggressive cutaneous tumor Uh, the risk factors include advanced age, previous radiation, Moyer syndrome with colorectal carcinoma. Then mostly they are present in the ocular region. Extraocular regions uh, uh, involvement is rare with face, neck, and external ear. Among those, it is very uncommon to see a severe cell car carcinoma, gland carcinoma, to be present over the nasal vestibule skin. and it can be uh, misdiagnosed uh, as a sebaceous variant of basal cell carcinoma also so we have to put uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry markers and standard treatment is uh, uh, is resection with wide wide margins and most micrographic surgery and there should be reconstruction they can be uh, lim lim uh, for limited defects we can do primary closure and for large defects we can use local flaps like transfusion nasal labial or uh, as we did a uh, of parabidin forehead flap or distant free flaps radial uh, artery forehead flaps uh, forearm flaps for uh, osteocartilaginous reconstruction you can use a free bone ilia crest or a cartilage septal conical costal graft also so i would conclude by saying that uh, the sebaceous cell carcinoma should be considered in all nasal vestibule masses, masses and an early biopsy should be done in view of the aggressive nature and metastasis uh, and difficulty to differentiate from other benign and malignant conditions and surgical excision with clear margin and frozen section is the treatment of choice our patient is doing well post operatively uh, 10 months after having undergone partial thyroidectomy and bilateral parabidin for a flap repair which is the best recommended treatment friends thank you so to see if there is any involvement of the bony uh, nasal bones or bony septum bone bone The if it is a squamous cell carcinoma, it 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 it, uh, it, it can happen. But in superficial cell carcinoma, it is mostly a superficial tegetoid type of a spread which occurs with the superficial skin. Thank you, sir. Thank you,
गुड मॉर्निंग आई एम डॉक्टर सोनाली त्यागी आई एम प्रेजेंटिंग अ केस रिपोर्ट ऑन पैपिलरी कार्सिनोमा थायराइड इन प्रेगनेंसी थायराइड कैंसर इज द सेकंड मोस्ट कॉमन कैंसर डायग्नोस्ड इन प्रेगनेंसी आफ्टर ब्रेस्ट कैंसर द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ थायराइड कैंसर इन दिस सिचुएशन हैज मल्टीपल गोल्स दैट इज टू कंट्रोल द मैलिग्नेंसी ओवरकम द हार्मोनल डिस्टरबेंसेस ऑफ द थायराइडेक्टमी एंड टू अवॉइड एनी drawback from the fetus as a result of maternal hypothyroidism in this uh, a 23 year old female had presented to a opd with a complaint of midline neck swelling from 3 months according to the patient it was it was initially small in size and it was gradually increasing there were no other symptoms uh, the physical examination was found to be normal however on local examination a single swelling was seen around 3 to 3 cm high oval shaped extending till 1 cm above the suprasternal notch and peripherally the overlying skin was normal and the swelling was found to be moving on deglutition the patient was sent for ultrasound of the neck thyroid profile and after receiving the report of the ultrasound neck we sent her for uh, fnac fnac showed features suggestive of papillary carcinoma thyroid and the patient was new thyroid However, at the time of admission, patient complained of amenorrhea for uh, one month and five days, following which a urine pregnancy test was done, and it was found to be weakly positive. An obstetrician reference was done, in which a transvaginal scan was advised, which showed an intrauterine live pregnancy of five weeks. After this diagnosis, her therapy options were discussed in detail. The patient decided to undergo surgery in the second trimester of pregnancy with thyroid replacement therapy following surgery. A repeat scan was done before surgery and after surgery, which showed single life intrauterine pregnancy of 16 weeks and 5 days. Patient was taken up for total thyroidectomy with a modified radical neck resection. Surgery was done under general anesthesia. No complications were associated with the surgery or general anesthesia. patient was shifted to icu overnight and then on post operative day 4 she was discharged uh, patient was put on uh, tablet thyroxine 100 microgram per day she was called on for uh, follow up after 7 days then after 10 days the pregnancy was uneventful and she delivered a healthy baby boy at 39 weeks period of gestation the thyroid cancer is the most common endocrine malignancy frequently diagnosed in females it uh, ranks among the most common cancers during pregnancy with a prevalence of 3.6 to 14 for 1 lakh live births the standard treatment remains high total or near total thyroidectomy in pregnant females maternal and female outcomes have to be taken into consideration before deciding for surgery it has been suggested that surgery can be done after delivery of patient with no evidence of advanced cancer and thyroidectomy second time missed of pregnancy in others pregnant women with thyroid cancer may require post surgical remnant ablation depending on the tumor stage histology and patient preferences women who are contemplating iodine therapy frequently express concern about breastfeeding and future fertility so i conclude that this poster has presented a case of thyroid cancer in pregnancy and the treatment undertaken There is a concern about the female and maternal outcomes, the timing of surgery, the use of levothyroxine after surgery, and the assessment of follow-up. Thank you. So, how did this patient second trimester? Yes, sir. So she was a primary gravida. So the gynecologists were not in the favor of medical termination of pregnancy. So they advised the patient to go in for surgery at the during second trimester of pregnancy. Any other doctor besides the surgeon? Uh, so because uh, the disease has already started three months before the diagnosis of the pregnancy, so uh, our uh, team as well as the patients were not in the favor of delaying the surgery for very long. So it can be done, but so on ultrasound there were no abnormal lymph nodes. So. Uh, we thought that the disease is limited to the thyroid, so it is better to uh, operate during pregnancy. Also.
Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm going to, my name is Dr. Aditya Kotal, and I'm going to present a poster on a case report on the electrophysical abscess as a complication of cervical spine tuberculosis. As we all know, tuberculosis of cervical spine is a very rare injury, and it can, it can present with mediated or unrelated symptoms and can be diagnostic dilemma for the treating clinician due to important <clears throat> neurovascular and respiratory symptoms associated with the cervical tuberculosis. The accurate diagnosis and prompt management of the cases becomes clinical necessity and patient outcomes. Case report, <clears throat> 11 year female, come to, 11 year female child come to our ward with chief complaint of pain in neck and intermittent fever since three months. The pain was persistent in nature and aggravated with neck movements. <clears throat> child also su suffered from mm, suffered from low grade fever and subsequently developed uh, <clears throat> dull itching pain in both arms. Dysphagia and change in voice was also occurred in later in, in later in course. We, we continue with the examination. We send in the in season oropharynx, there is a bulge in posterior pharyngeal wall and in the scopic laryngeal examination, <clears throat> the, uh, there, there was normal finding. Okay. <clears throat> in X-ray, in, in Google for X-ray lateral view, STN. Then we'll end later, everybody, there is <clears throat> pre vertebral soft tissue Vertebral soft tissue sideways were there in uh, we, um, then we underwent for CT. In CT, there is a collection, peripheral uh, collection, CT showing collection in pre-vertebral space, retropharyngeal spaces, and destruction of body of C3 vertebra. We start empirically the IV antibiotics, then we, uh, then there is no regulation of symptoms in the patient. Then we proceed uh, for the aspiration and send the pus for pus culture and synthesis. There was no in pus culture, there was no growth of organism. Then we have the suspicion of tuberculosis. We send, uh, we send, then we aspirate uh, therapeutic aspiration of the pus with, uh, with to leave symptoms patient. But with due course of time, there is again collection of pus in there. Then we suspect for tuberculosis. We send for AFB, but AFB was mm -hmm. negative. And then send that pus again for CVNAT. And this was uh, CVNAT, then it was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. We started ATTT regime when within, within two weeks of uh, ATT regime, patient, uh, patient um, developed uh, resolved symptoms of uh, dysphagia and voice and voice improvement was there. And within due course of time, and, and we are also doing the therapeutic aspiration of personal personal pain involved. With due course of time, patient also developed uh, <clears throat> relief symptoms like uh, uh, pain in both upper limbs are also relieved. Uh, with due course of time, and within six months, patient completely zero the symptoms. Conclusion, as you all know, TB, <coughs> uh, TB is a rare entity and very difficult from the skin. And you can also say we have the different bacterial osteomatic and conservative of those with ATT and therapeutic aspiration can be recommended as standard of care in most cases. Surgical development trichostomy can be reserved for very selective cases and high index of clinical suspicion and prompt approach can save morbidity and mortality. Sure. So, retropharyngeal abscess most frequently in the children of less than three years of age. It can due to the separation of lymph nodes, retropharyngeal lymph nodes. In adults, it can cause by the penetrating neck injury. What drug do you use for this patient? What drugs? What drugs do you use for this patient? We uh, initially we start empirically IV antibiotics, yeah. but symptoms are not resolved with IV antibiotics. Mention the drugs. Uh, yes, sir. That is uh, ATT regime. I assume that you can be seen that with advice from Dr. Center.
Good morning, respected sir. My name is Dr. Hena Mona. I'll be presenting a case report on a giant complicated glossal cervical AV malformation managed with the external carotid artery ligation with serial percutaneous injection of sclerotherapy. AV malformation is one of the AV malformation is defined as the vascular anomalies which are commonly present at birth, but sometimes it can be seen at later of life. It can be divided into two types: a high flow lesion type and a low flow lesion type. By the high flow lesion type, it is defined as the arterial and the arteriovenous type, and the low flow lesion types are the venous, the lymphatic, and the capillary system type. The exact mechanism of how the malformation is formed is not understood yet, but the hemodynamic alteration, which is commonly seen in the malformation, has been described as the stealing of the blood from the high resistance vein arterial side to the low resistance side, thereby forming an abnormal low resistance circuit which keeps on stealing or shunting the blood from the vascular channel. In the oral cavity, the more, uh, it can be, the AV malformation can be found in any part of the oral cavity, most commonly in the anterior two-third of the tongue, the palate, the gingiva, and the buccal mucosa. There are many therapeutic options which are available for the treatment of this AV malformation, likely the, cervical, uh, the surgical resection, sclerotherapy, the uh, laser, laser excision and embolization. Here I report a case of a giant complica complicated glossal cervical AV malformation in a 35-year-old female, which presented to the ENT OPD with a history of one day of oral bleed, four, uh, three days of difficulty in breathing, four years of dysphagia and swelling in the oral cavity and next since 15 years. Emergency tracheostomy was performed in order to prevent the aspiration of uh, blood and to secure the airway. On the clinical examination, as we can see in the figure number one, we see a swollen tongue which was entirely occupying the oral cavity and which was protruding out of the oral cavity. The surface was coated and there was sites on the under surface of the tongue, there was sites of trauma due to the lower dentition. In the neck, a mass of six to five mm centimeter was present, which was soft to touch, uh, warm, soft, warm, uh, soft, warm, and brood was present over the surface. MR angiography was done, and it was found that a AV malformation of the anterior two third of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, and the left submandibular region of size four, uh, seven point nine into seven point eight into seven point five into four point nine centimeters. The patient underwent left carotid artery ligation followed by percutaneous serial injection sclerotherapy with 3% sodium tetradecyl sulfate. The patient was followed up every two weeks. And as we can see in the third figure, the, the third figure in the figure number A, it was after two cycles of sclerotherapy. On the second figure, it is the after four cycles of sclerotherapy. And after six cycles of sclerotherapy, we can see that the size of the tongue was almost reduced to normal. From the, uh, after this, the patient was very much happy with the therapeutic outcome. From this, what I want to highlight is there are different modalities of treatment of the AV malformation, like the surgical excision, embolization, laser excision, and sclerotherapy. From in places where the resources of the laser excision is not available, in this kind of giant glossal cervical AV malformation, surgical excision can be a complication due to intraoperative blood loss, and there is a high chances of recurrence. So sclerotherapy can be the modality of treatment. And as stated by a study by the Simpsons, multiple serial injections of this sclerotherapy until we receive a satisfactory outcome can be performed without, uh, without a definitive side, without any side effects. For smaller reasons, single therapy can be performed, but for multiple lesions, we can under, we can give multiple uh, multiple injections of the sclerotherapy without any complications. So sclerotherapy alone by using different uh, agents can be the only modality of treatment or it can be adjunct to the surgery. Thank you. How do you decide when to stop the drug? Sir, basically, there has been no. 
So uh, basically, there has not been any any studies which stated that the, this much amount should be the limit of the injection. The one study was done by the assumption where we saw that the, we can give multiple injections until a uh, satisfactory outcome is obtained. Why do we should give the so in this trial, we give to uh, we give the injections at every two weeks, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Sanjit. I am President. <coughs> Their occurrence of the double point will also fade us at the same location in same alignment. Foreign body ingestion more commonly in the children under the age of three years. Point infants are the most commonly ingested foreign body, most likely become lost in the stomach, flows by oesophagus, oropharynx, and the intestine. Battery, battery, bone, and jewelry are others commonly indigested foreign body. A treated foreign body occasionally seen in adult, mostly localizing right bronchus. My case is two years old female child, resident, residency of the Faridabad, Haryana, <coughs> present with ENT emergency with the history of dysphagia, history of accidental foreign body ingestion before the before six hour admissions. Uh, there is no any history of respiratory distress in, in any other complaints. On examination, patient's general condition was fair with normal pulse rate and respiratory rate. The ENT examination was unremarkable. A plain X-ray of neck, entrocostal view, and lateral view shows a 
radio opic round body at the level of lipopharynx with hollow sign and a step off sign which similar to set of button battery uh, but <clears throat> then patient what plan for the oesophagoscopy foreign body removal under general, general anesthesia on endoscope on oesophagoscopy uh, there was two quite uh, stuck each other as as long as just above the trichopharynx the two coins removed successfully by gasping of forceps without uh, causing any injury check oesophagoscopy done till the gastro oesophagus splinter and found to be normal post post operative neck and chest x ray was done which which was found to be normal and child has an eventful post operative recovery uh, the indigenous foreign body in pediatric population present a greater challenge in for surgeon and commonly this event was unwitted by parent lead to a event greater diagnostic challenge finds remains a most commonly indigenous foreign body in children typically quine become in, <laughs> impacted proximal oesophagus as the level of trichopharynx and removed within 24 to 48 hours generally recommended foreign body indigestion in pediatric age group most commonly because of the uh, increased mobility play while eating and oral tendon or a tendency also figure foreign body removal are twice more commonly than bronchus foreign body but most of them goes to a stomach and no need to necessary removal a foreign body once in the chest can varying symptoms initially from the choking local and local discomfort to dysphagia respiratory distress and also figure perforation and long term complications are also figured as teaser and tracheo also figured fistula occurrence of the multiple coin injection are rare and rarely reported flat objects like coins most commonly held at the trichopharynx splinter white adults are held in the just below the splinter sharp and pointed object can lost anywhere in the oesophagus and gi tracts entroposterior and lateral radi radiography are done so presence of the localized of the radio opaque foreign body and the radio loose radio loose and foreign body can be diagnosed by fluoroscopy on conclusion the the rare case of the two injuries foreign body a uh, coin become impacted for um, perfect radiocly alignment emphasizes the um, importance of history thoroughly examination and the check check esophagoscopy the potential limitation of the chest x ray initial assessment and injuries foreign body thank you Uh, for the, in multiple points, maybe left, yeah, others point body maybe left, and, and uh, the trauma, trauma, role of the end trauma during first was was very Yes, yeah, to to during first so for example, maybe cause trauma for reality in color. Why do you do chest X-ray? Chest X-ray for the any for the for uh, mainly see the complication or if any others for the maybe left. Yes, Doctor Tarun Dabbal.
Good morning, respected seniors. Uh, I am here to present my poster on a rare case of isolated pre genesis of thyroid dysmus with its surgical implications. Thyroid gland is the first endocrine gland to develop in embryo, which weighs around 15 to 25 grams and approaches 5 into 3 into 1.5 centimeter in size. Isthmus connects both the lobes of thyroid and lies against the second to fourth tracheal vents. Anomalies of de uh, development of thyroid gland, automorphology of the gland, and may cause clinical and functional disorders. Various development anomalies of thyroid gland reported, such as ectopic thyroids, thyroid nocile cysts, or crystal rods, and persistent py uh, pyramidal lobes. However, the most uncommon anomalies include the agenesis or the hemiagenesis of the thyroid lobe and the agenesis of the isthmus. Agenesis of the isthmus may be associated with absence of thyroid lobe or presence of ectopic thyroid tissue. However, agenesis of isthmus alone is extremely rare. Incidence of agenesis of isthmus has been reported to vary from 5 to 10 percent. This condition does not usually cause any clinical manifestation by itself. And the diagnosis is usually incidental uh, in the course of investigation in the presence of thyroid pathology or during the cadaveric dissection. Uh, case report, a 50-year-old female presented in Department of ENT with complaints of swelling over the anterior aspects of neck for the past 10 years and there was no history of any relevant surgical intervention. There was no history of any features or symptoms of suggestive of hypo or hyperthyroidism. On examination, there was a 3, a 3 into 2 centimeter swelling present in the right lobe of thyroid. Patient was euthyroid on thyroid function test and the FNC was done, which showed a colloid goiter with cystic degeneration. Ultrasonography was suggestive of heterogeneous echoic nodule of 2 into 1.8 centimeter in the right lobe of the thyroid. She was planned for right thyroidectomy. As we can see in image 1, during the surgery on retracting the strap muscle, surprisingly, we reached the bare trachea. The, uh, the isthmus could not be located despite adequate exploration. As the isthmus was absent, exploration was also conducted for ectopic thyroid tissues, but none was found. The specimen was found for histopathological examination, and the report showed adenomatous goiter with focal areas of sclerosis. In the uh, second image, we can see the post op operative period was uneventful. In the discussion, Agenesis of thyroid isthmus uh, is developmental anomaly and defined as complete or congenital absence of the thyroid isthmus, which was first reported in 1952 by Allen in 2-4% to of the cases. Hansen also reported absence of isthmus in 6-8% to of cases. Embryologically, the median and large develops from the ventral surface of primitive pharynx between the first and second pharyngeal arches, whereas the later analgin developed from the fourth and fifth pharyngeal pouches. Later analysis fuses with the uh, fuses with the median enlarged by six weeks of gestation. A diverticulum forms at the foramen cecum at around 16 to 17 weeks of gestation, which extend distally, forming a bilobed structure. This diverticulum becomes a solid cellular cord-like structure, which is known as thyroglossal duct. It has been postulated that the thyroglossal duct divides at the higher level and it may uh, generate thyroid loads with an absent isthmus. DFLS M et al. and Dumont IE et al. reported that mutation in the development gene TITF1, TAX8, FOXE1, and TITF2 may result in agenesis of thyroid isthmus, especially the gene TITF2. Methods routinely employed to evaluate thyroid pathologies include ultrasonography, computed tomography, MRI, uh, imaging and the scintography, which may reveal the condition. In some cases, as in ours, it may be an incidental finding intraoperatively. The rare embryological variants may have significant clinical imp implications. If the diagnosis of the absent thyroid dysmus is made, then we should anticipate other embryological anomalies of the thyroid gland also, or the surrounding structure, which have related phylogenetic development.
also hemorrhological variation should raise the suspicion of syndromic condition that may involve the thyroid gland in case of thyroid asthma agenesis is a differential diagnosis of autonomous thyroid nodule thyroiditis primary carcinomas neoplastic metastasis and amyloidosis should be ruled out too an absent thyroid asthma may be associated with an anatomical variation in vasculature nerve supply or even the morphology of the lobe so meticulous and the cautious dissection is imperative to prevent injury to the vital structure in cases where the surgery is being performed for the thyroid malignancies and the asthma is found to be absent it is essential to explore thoroughly for the presence of any ectopic thyroid tissues or other anomalies like persistent pyramidal lobe or levator glandular thyroid to ensure any adequate clearance other references so uh, depending on the descent of the thyroid according to the gestation the uh, for mn cecum uh, at for mn cecum we can see and according to thyroid nodule like looking at the thyroid yes sir what what sir sir basically we uh, went towards the thyroid bone and below that uh, most commonly thyroid nodule ducts with the thyroid nodule cysts and ducts are usually present there only so we look for thyroid and uh, exploration around there sir it, uh, we did the ultrasonography ultrasonography uh, revealed the normal isthmus gland by the radiological investigation but other than that uh, no other investigation was no sir uh, afterwards after three of them thank you doctor Good morning, everyone. I am presenting my poster on an unusual case of fractures, fractured tracheostomy tube in the tracheobronchial tree of a pediatric patient. Tracheostomy is a common procedure which is usually undertaken to secure the airway in case of an emergency or the patients who require prolonged ventilation. So there are different kinds of materials which we can use, which are either metallic or non-metallic. So approximately 20% of the patients are usually discharged or tracheostomized. So they have to take proper care and management to prevent uh, complications at home. The fracture of a uh, fractured tracheostomy tube and its migration is a rare complication. Uh, is a rare complication, and the most common risk factors are the usage of the same tracheostomy tube for a longer time, alkaline bronchial secretions, repeated cleaning and sterilization. aging of the tracheostomy tube tissue reaction to the tube and manufacturing defect 
So the case report was that a seven-year-old male child reported to ENT emergency with a history of aspiration of part of the Kiosme tube. A seven year old child uh, presented to our ENT emergency with a history of aspiration of a part of a tracheostomy tube while uh, suction was being done by his mother at home. So they noticed that the neck plate was in the place while they could not visualize the rest of the tube. So the child was tracheostomized about 10 months back and he was on decannulation trial in our uh, OPD. And a day before yesterday, one day before, the patient. Uh, Patient's tracheostomy tube was downsized to 4.5 mm uncuff uh, to a polyvinyl chloride type. So at the time of presentation, patient uh, had mild respiratory distress with uh, tachypnea, tachycardia, while the saturation was around 90% on room air and maintaining saturation of 99% on oxygen. When the patient came to us, we examined on the neck examination, there was a contracted uh, stoma site and minimal granulation around it. The air entry was reduced on the left side. Uh, so we did a chest X-ray PA view, which revealed that the part, as you can see in the figure uh, number one, that a part of the Kiosme tube was slightly uh, visualized in the left main bronchus. So then the uh, airway of the patient was secured with a 4.5 mm Kiosme tube, PVC type, and oxygen inhalation was given before shifting the patient to the operation theater. Uh, rigid bronchoscopy was done with a size four bronchoscope, while oxygen oxygenation was done through the tracheostomy tube. So, uh, as uh, the telescope was uh, moved beside the uh, tracheostomy tube that we have inserted, so we kept on deflating the cup so as to move the telescope uh, beside it, and then we visualized the uh, remaining part of the that foreign body tracheostomy tube approximately three centimeter below the uh, stoma side. And then we grasped it using an optical forceps, and the foreign body was removed in total. And then the patient uh, was discharged after two days by first shifting the patient to the PICU. So this is the second figure showing the intraoperative photograph uh, of the tracheostomy tube, and th that is the uh, grasping optical forceps. Uh, discussion is that many uh, the first report uh, which was done for the aspiration of fractures tracheostomy tube was uh, in the year 1960. So the metallic tracheostomy tubes were usually preferred in older children and those requiring a uh, prolonged tracheostomy. However, in younger children, non-metallic tubes were pre uh, preferred due to less airway resistance and they were more pliable and uh, snugly fit to the airway. Also, the uh, PVC type uh, tracheostomy tube, they have uh, less mucus adherence due to the inert nature and smooth surface. Uh, smooth uh, surface and but they are more costly and require regular suction. So uh, another review was given uh, by Pero Mishai et al. where 20 cases concluded that the fractured tube in trachea most common location or most common location was usually right main bronchus and uh, uh, whereas in our case the tube was PVC type and was dislodged in trachea and uh, moving more towards the left bronchus. And the patient was presented with a minimal respiratory distress. The junction between the neck plate and the tube is mostly the most common fracture site, followed by the distal end and the fenestra. The patient present most commonly with a mild respiratory distress, uh, along with the, some cough, hemoptysis, wheezing, recurrent pneumonia, etc. In a pediatric population, patients also have reported to have deaths uh, because of the uh, foreign body ingestion. 
So the figure number three, we can see the broken uh, tracheostomy tube. The neck plate is separated from the rest of the tube. And uh, the rigid bronchoscopy is the main treatment of choice for the fractured tracheostomy tube removal and through the stoma, uh, via the stoma side. But in our case, we did it uh, via the oral cavity. So the conclusion is that the tracheostomy uh, tube fracture and migration is an avoidable complication. It can be avoided by careful inspection and taking care of the tracheostomy tube properly at home and appropriate suctioning and care. Thank you. So we can teach the patient for the proper tracheostomy care. And uh, so mainly the, uh, in our case, it was uh, more likely the manufacturing defect. But uh, otherwise, the uh, uh, patient cannot or uh, should get the tracheostomy tube change. Sir, so, yes, sir. Uh, the metallic ones are less uh, chances of them being fractured. Sir, so the uh, child was a known case of a neural degenerative uh, disorder. So he had recurrent pneumonia and uh, he had a history of lung collapse also. So around 10 months back, he was uh, tracheostomized in our own hospital. Yes, sir. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone who is here. Uh, myself, Nitish, and I'm going to present a poster on the topic of uh, mucormycosis of the mandible that uh, is a rare reference. Uh, so, starting, uh, mucormycosis is not a new thing to us, especially as Indian. As compared to globally, we have almost 80 times the incidence. Globally, the incidence is 0 0.005 to 1.7 million uh, population, while in India, we have as high as uh, 140 per, per million population. Then introducing mucormycosis, it's an injury-invasive fungal disease that is uh, caused by mucormycosis uh, family of fungi that include rhizopus, abscedia, and the mucor fungus. It, uh, it, it is most commonly the disease of immunocompromised individuals that include uh, diabetic patients, especially landing up in uh, metabolic acidosis via diabetic ketoacidosis, other causes of metabolic acidosis, and along with that, transplant recipients receiving an immun immunomodulatory therapy. Leukemia patients, uh, that is primarily because of the voriconazole prophylaxis that these patients receive. Hemochromatosis patients, because uh, as we all know, fungi uh, needs iron for its metabolism. So in hemochromatosis patients, we have abundance of free iron. It supports the thriving of the fungi. And in the patients of neutropenia, because uh, basically fungi is the main defense against the fungi of our 
immune system is the phagocytic phagocytic action uh, more as compared to the uh, T cell mediated reaction. That's why in uh, people living with uh, HIV, the incidence is not as high as compared to the normal population. Whereas in uh, cases with neutropenia, the mortality rate reaches almost 100%. So uh, presenting my case, uh, mucormycosis uh, to us is familiar in the systems of rhino orbital cere cerebral, followed by the pulmonary, then cutaneous, and uh, the last we have the disseminated type. But mucormycosis of mandible is something that is encountered very rarely. And while going through the literature, I could uh, barely find 20 to 25 case reports. So that also globally. So. Uh, uh, reporting about a case that presented to us in the OPD, where the patient has had complaint of pain and pus discharge from the left-sided upper and lower uh, molars, and he had no other complaints. But the patient also had a history of uh, COVID-19 infection for which patient uh, needed oxygen therapy as well as steroid therapy with uh, high-dose methyl prednisolone for five days. And patient was already a diagnosed diabetic but uh, he was controlled with HbA1c reporting as 5.7%. Then uh, in this uh, patient, uh, we referred the patient to the dental department for uh, his complaints and on, on the orthopentamogram, they found that the bone was a bit necrotic. So they went for a local exploration in which they found that the uh, cortex of the mandible as well as the maxilla was found necrotic. So the then our dental team went for a local debridement of the tissues and the histopath that was sent from that reported with mucormycosis while that was the least thing that we were suspecting in that patient. So uh, they uh, advised us further to get a CPPNS for this patient to look for other uh, parts if they were involved and to uh, our surprise, we found that the only thing involved except the maxilla and the mandible was the left-sided uh, maxillary sinus that showed just mild mucosal thickening. So uh, the patient had already undergone deprivement, so the surgical part was almost over. So we went on uh, to administer the uh, second therapy that we have for this uh, systemic invasive fungal infection, that is a uh, drug of choice, which is liposomal amphotericin B in the doses of uh, 3 to 5 milligrams per kg. The patient was uh, kept on 200 milligrams per day amphotericin B and the patient is still admitted with us undergoing this therapy and is improving clinically and is showing no signs of recurrence and his, uh, his clinical complaints have also resolved while maintaining the uh, uh, renal profile in normal limits that is uh, being monitored uh, intensive, intensively. So uh, with this, uh, I, I need to emphasize on the fact that for, uh, in the reported cases of mandibular mucormycosis, we usually find the history of uh, dental intervention going on that could be a root canal or a dental extraction that pro uh, provides a way for inoculation of the fungal spores in the patient. But in this patient, we had no history of dental extraction. There was no history of any uh, dental procedure, but still the patient had uh, infection of the mandible uh, via the fungi. So uh, whenever we are uh, encountering such patient in the OPD, if there is involvement of other parts and the sinuses by fungus and the patient uh, gives clinical complaints that are suggestive of involvement of the mandible, we should also keep in mind that even without a dental procedure, there might be involvement of uh, the mandible. And also, sir, uh, in the reported cases, we have saw. Uh, just want to conclude that the mucormycosis of mandible has relatively intolerant course as compared to the sinus, uh, sinus and or vital disease, and uh, it is uh, very well controlled via surgical deprivation and medical management if uh, detected timely. Thank you so much.
A very good afternoon to our respected teachers, our seniors and our fellow colleagues. Um, today I will be presenting on the giant cell uh, tumor of the maxilla. So as we all know, the giant cell tumor is actually a locally aggressive benign neoplasm, accounting for about four to 10% of all bone tumors. Now what makes um, its occurrence rare in the, in the craniofacial skeleton is because it accounts of just approximately 2% of the head and neck region. Now, as we know that the GC, the giant cell tumor itself occurs in the epiphyseal or the metaphyseal lesions of long bones, uh, most commonly in the proximal femur, followed by the, uh, followed by the uh, radius, the sacrum, and so on. However, if it does occur within the head and neck region, it usually occurs within the mandible, the squamous part of the temporal bone. It occurs in the ethmoid bone. Its occurrence in the maxilla itself is very, very unusual and atypical. Now, what makes my uh, case report even more rare is the fact that the, uh, the prevalent age group of occurrence of the GCD is uh, between 15 to 40 years of age, which is uh, with a peak incidence of uh, being the third decade of life. So what makes it even rare is the occurrence of the GCD in the maxilla in a pediatric age group. So this has been sparsely uh, described in literature, and I will be presenting the case report on the same. So my case report is about a six-year-old female patient. She had presented to the Department of Otolaryngology, uh, Emergency Department, with a right-sided swelling on the face, on the cheek, for a, a period of three months. The patient had no complaints of pain as such. However, she had complaints of difficulty in chewing, which is quite evident also, as you can see here, the patient, uh, owing to the size of the swelling, there, there's, uh, the patient is not able to approximate the lips. So now we had um, examined on intraoral examination. As you can see, the swelling is said to be smooth. It was found to arise from the right side of the maxilla, and it was four to four centimeter in size. And it also involved the upper margin of the, al the alveolus and patient also had grossly myelin teeth. Now, however, in um, all other systemic uh, manifest, there was no other systemic manifestations in this patient. So we had subjected the patient to a CCT phase, which as you can see here, the patient, uh, it reveals a well-defined uh, heterogeneously expansive lytic lesion, okay, which was found to arise again from the right uh, anterior maxilla. And there was bony scalloping and destruction of the maxilla, with, um, which was uh, found to extend into the adjacent GG for Michael Sarkis with cortical breach as well. So now it was approximately uh, measuring 2.4 into 3.5 into 4.3 centimeters. And um, it had uh, it was shown to uh, involve the upper lingual um, surface as well. And as I mentioned again, with cortical breach. So a uh, pre-operative uh, histopathological investigation was sent, which yielded the diagnosis of a giant cell reparative granuloma. So we had also subjected uh, several hematological and biochemical tests like calcium, phosphate, alkaline, uh, phosphatase, and BTH, all of which were normal in this patient. Now, well, we intervened by performing a simple excision by a sublabial approach. Uh, and we had uh, removed the bulk of the um, tumor in total from the following uh, the, in the subperiosteal plane. And um, 
post operative uh, uh, post operatively is uneventful. So the patient was being followed up regularly with no incidence of recurrence. So now I would like to highlight what is the, um, the importance of, of, of clinically assessing a patient anytime a patient, even though despite the rarity of, of the occurrence of the GCT in the head and neck region, in the projective age group. So we need to have a patient coming, uh, we need to differentiate it from other lesions like um, uh, giant cell reparative granuloma, osteosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, brown tumors or hyperparathyroidism, which is precisely why we subjected the patients to the uh, histopath the biochemical changes. So that would, that we did a diagnosis of exclusion for the brown tumor of um, hyperparathyroidism. So now, Post operatively, the biopsy report yielded a GCT. Now, histopathological diagnosis states in uh, the, the picture here yielded um, um, giant cells which were interspersed in the stroma. So, now it's very important, it's very vital because GCT and giant cell reparative granuloma itself, they are very, they have very similar presenting features as well as histopathological uh, diagnosis. So um, it's important to, uh, it's, it's, it becomes vital for us to bear in mind the diagnosis, the differential diagnosis, and to, to assess the patient. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, our, the patient, um, we had uh, we have performed a sublabial uh, incision, sublabial, given a sublabial incision, removed the tumor in total, and we had done a primary suturing of the, uh, of the defect without any, without the need of the grafting. Now, in the literature has been described the use of extensive approaches like maxillectomy with catheter grafting. So, but in our case, we did not. Yes, yes. Good afternoon to all my seniors. I, I am presenting a case of a post tumor in a child. So uh, the spread of infection from the beyond the perinatal sinuses that to the complications. So in frontal sinusitis, the anterior spread of infection that to the subperiosteal abscess, leading to post tumor and posterior breaching of the posterior table led to the intracranial complication like subdural empyema. So here I am presenting a case of a 11 year old female uh, which uh, presented to ENT emergency with progressive swelling of forehead and low grade fever. Uh, the patient was admitted and was given entirely ceftriaxone. And in addition, we prescribed major decongestant and systemic antihistamine therapy. So uh, here, uh, we can show a forex uh, uh, frontal lesion swelling in a child 
in diagnostic nasal endoscopy there are there is a bilateral middle terminal hypertrophy but uh, the patient has no history of any nasal discharge or any nasal obstruction so in investigation uh, we perform uh, ccd 